from the top rope, and the great American bash, I bid you all good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you may be in this great land of ours or around the world. Welcome to the $55 million studio on the Pro Wrestle Machine. Through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine, October 5, 1998 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Lawler and Jim Carrey Angle. WWF Breakdown Results. Plus tons more. By Observer Staff. What on the surface was a very innocuous story, one that happens all over the world on a daily basis, a pro wrestling angle, actually unwittingly became an ironic and even troubling story and not because one of the participants in the angle was movie star Jim Carrey. Jerry Lawler with Carrey, playing the role of the late Andy Kaufman, reprised in some way the Kaufman angle from 1982 which got Lawler his first taste of national publicity, during the filming of the movie Man on the Moon on September 22nd. Actually the angle was being built up all week with Carey, acting like Kaufman during the filming, provoking Lawler acting like Kaufman had, both as cameras were filming, and many times when cameras were off in an attempt to work the extras and probably even at least some of the more naive of those working on the movie. Then, supposedly unscripted, Carey spit at Lawler, as the story goes, just as Kaufman had done but it wasn't in the script, Lawler chased him and grabbed him in a headlock. Carey was taken to the hospital. The word was that Carey suffered some sort of a neck injury, came out of the hospital later that day wearing a neck brace just as Kaufman had for months after his angle with Lawler, and was fined for filming the next day, and that he would never work with Lawler again, not true as they're scheduled to do more filming in November to reprise the famous Lawler slash Kaufman angle on the David Letterman show, and that all of Lawler's scenes would be cut out of the movie, also not true. There's nothing wrong with a publicity stunt, and since Lawler's life has largely been living an act for the past 28 years and master dual reality angles in real life and in wrestling before the term even existed, and he's one of the masters at it, and Carey is probably the biggest movie star in the world, no doubt both were able to pull of a very believable work. But still, as the news was covered not only huge in Los Angeles that night but as a fairly major news story nationally the next day, my main thoughts were a message on my answering machine from a sports writer on September 23rd who said after all the coverage that he was embarrassed and appalled at his profession. They had already floated the angle the week before in the National Enquirer, were building it up all week and many people working in the film were privately bragging days ahead of time about what Carrie and Lawler had cooked up as a stunt to gather publicity for the movie. Not to mention, it was very similar to the angle, right down to the mock hospital visit and neck brace, to the angle that the movie itself was portraying. What irony, huh? And it was just a few weeks after Steve Austin and Regis Philbin tried to do almost the exact same angle, which nobody, well, except for USA Today which covered it as if it were a shoot in the gossip column, even bit on. Which must have been a cruel wake-up call to Philbin's ego, to the point even the WWF itself never acknowledged its existence. Coming on the heels of something very similar, with two guys in a movie recreating something very similar, makes the whole thing pretty damn transparent to start with even if it wasn't pro wrestling in which you have to be suspicious of everything to begin with. The fact the very beginning of looking into the story would reveal people on the movie, while not being aware of exactly what was going to happen, were well aware a publicity stunt of some sort was being built up all week. And while there were media outlets who covered it as if it were nothing more than a publicity stunt, they were in the distinct minority. Many didn't even hint of the possibility it could have been staged, USA Today treated it as serious news and even got a quote defending Lawler and the WWF's position by Vince McMahon. Jim Ross, who worked with Lance Russell doing the announcing on the wrestling scenes in the movie, appeared as something of Lawler's spokesperson on shows like Access Hollywood and Entertainment Tonight the next day. Great for Lawler and Kerry, and if they continue the angle as Kaufman did after Letterman by working many shows on the old Memphis circuit feuding with Lawler, at one point even costing Lawler the world title in a famous match with Nick Bockwinkle, while it was an age-old disguise finish, it was executed as one of the best finishes I've ever seen. And even teaming at another time with Lawler against Jimmy Hart and company into something on pay-per-view and or television, it's great for the WWF. They deserve credit. That's their job. And for anyone to blanket the media on its coverage, well, that's wrong as well. There is no such thing as a collective thought of media, and people who collectively use those terms as all-encompassing are generally taking the same kind of shortcuts as the wrestlers who rely on shortcuts rather than actually working to get by. The media consists of individuals and numerous decision-makers, most of whom don't work together and most services of whom make independent value judgments, although they are often fed similar or the same information which would certainly be the case on a minor story like this, although it wasn't covered as a minor story in the Los Angeles market. There were those in the media who probably knew the story was BS and ignored it, some who didn't know and were fooled, and that happens. 
mistakes from a lack of complete knowledge of a story are mistakes, but that is simply part of that profession and a part of life that can never change. An honest mistake on this story may be very naive, even stupid, but it's not unethical or a breach of trust. Some who assumed, but didn't know for sure, that's a tricky one to handle because you can't prove it. It involves a big movie star and people were talking about it a little in the real world, and how they play it is a little harder. But the most disheartening of all are the ones, and this story brought this home to bear, who did know what it was, and chose not to let the facts get in the way of a good fake news story. Yeah, I was appalled and embarrassed about some people in the profession as well. But it did create an interesting irony on Wednesday. Every wrestling fan that called here basically knew it was an angle and were laughing about how it was largely being played on their local TV. Most media outlets that called for comments largely assumed it was real, although I will say that nearly everyone with a wrestling media background didn't take it seriously for a second, and some there were highly disdainful of the stupidity of coverage they had seen. Considering how a vast majority of stories portray the wrestling industry, and more so the fans who support the industry, the day was an interesting irony when it comes to who the real marks were, but as the week went on, a bigger story didn't appear. All the outlets that covered it as straight news, as the days went on in the week where it became apparent to everyone it was a publicity stunt, how many of the outlets that reported the first story as a factual assault came back and said, we've been fooled? Mistakes happen, but if you can't admit to the major ones, to me, there is no credibility. At least in 1982 when Letterman was an unwitting accomplice to the Lawler-Kaufman angle, he came back on TV later that week and said it had been a publicity stunt arranged between the two and that he wasn't aware of it at the time. The answer to that question is the only real news story, and quite an unsettling one, as it regards nearly every outlet that initially covered the angle as a straight news story. The big news to most coming out of the WWF breakdown pay-per-view on September 27th in Hamilton, ONT was that Vince McMahon, having obviously just seen the movie, did the getaway car routine that the movie didn't capture, as he was stealing the WWF title from Steve Austin after a creative but flat live finish to the triple threat main event. But there were really three more important themes to the show before the largest crowd ever to witness an event at the Cops Coliseum of a sellout 17,405, 16,158 paying $322,099 Canadian and another $138,894 Canadian in merchandise. The four-hour house show format for a pay-per-view with the pay-per-view show being preceded by a live Sunday night heat on USA Network, drains the crowd and the heat was disappointing throughout the show with the exception of the finish of another triple threat match, this time in a cage, and in which Rocky Maivia wound up as the wrestler getting the biggest crowd pops of the night. Another problem stemming from the long-term problem of a lack of talent depth, was the same one that has plagued the last two WCW shows. By not even announcing publicly the undercard, there was little interest in almost all of the undercard matches. Even the technically good match involving local babyface Edge, going against Owen Hart, who has always been more over in Canada than the US, fell flat because fans weren't hyped up ahead of time for it. The third theme, which is not a problem, but more of an observation, is that in 1996, while the WWF was in a sense asleep at the wheel, WCW scoured the world and signed up much of the best young, and old as well, talent out there. Now, in hindsight they wasted them, and now is the time they desperately would have needed fresh awesome workers like La Parca to become this generation's Dusty Rhodes, but with a work rate, but instead it will never happen. Over the last year, it has been the WWF scouring the independent scene, aggressively signing up guys for these developmental contracts and this pay-per-view was more in the theme of trying to establish Edge, Gangrel, Bradshaw, Darren Drozdov, Val Venus and D'Lo Brown as major league players let alone the highly successful Rocky Maivia, as the top player for the future. Some will make it and some will flop. Most are nowhere near ready, but most also show a lot of potential to someday be ready. With the exception of Maivia, none, and that includes Venus who is a cult favorite, had the potential to be what the guys WCW squandered should have been. But the WWF hasn't squandered any of them at this point, although they didn't do Edge and Gangrel any favors putting them on pay-per-view in matches that weren't hyped and they did lose although were attempted to be protected by the nature of those losses. But their first appearance established neither of them as players either and even with the protection, because of the lack of reaction to both, ended up flattening both of them out. So overall it was just a show. I had it even after the undercard because the first two matches were a lot better than typical WWF undercard fair. The main event didn't deliver what a WWF main event should. The storyline was there, but the crowd enthusiasm to it and the work of the wrestlers were both way below the standard. Kane is in over his head when he's in main events but has been well protected. 
Undertaker is limited due to his injuries but has years of being a superstar to save him. Austin has created a top standard to live up to an ability to carry the Undertakers and Canes of this world, and on this night he didn't. Coming after Fall Brawl, in making a comparison, yeah, this might as well have been the greatest show of all time, but if this was a WCW show with the same overall quality, it would be heavily panned. This was a one-match card, a match not announced until an hour before show time which was very good, but one that nobody will confuse with being one of the best matches of the year, and a one-man show, Rocky. It had little heat overall and the main event was an average match. The angles that were built up well on TV, Venus vs. Runnels and the main event, came out flat, and they were the only important angles on the show to begin with. The heat show opened with the first of, count em, four Vince McMahon interviews, and a fifth one took place during the open for the pay-per-view and those German marching troops to signify whatever they signify has already been done before, which grew increasingly old. As many have noted, while McMahon is a better performer than Eric Bischoff, he has booked himself to actually be more overexposed and the end result if you check the ratings, is he is actually at this point a less effective character, although I bet if things stay the way they are, that's maybe temporary. He announced the cage match and reiterated his guarantee that Austin wouldn't leave the building with a title belt. More than a few references were brought up about the last WWF pay-per-view show in Canada, Survivor Series, over the next four hours. Hey, it isn't like an hour is going to go by in my life this month where somebody doesn't bring that show up. A. Golga, John Tenta, Pin Mosh, Charles Warrington, in 201 with the old earthquake splash. After the match Kurgan power bombed Thrasher and Giant Silva power bombed Mosh, Kurgan dresses almost exactly like Barry Gaspar, a 6'10 Canadian named Daryl Carolet, who was one of New Japan's biggest flop gimmicks of all time from the 80s. Ring entrance wasn't as enthusiastic as on TV. Match was terrible. Suddenly, shock of shocks, Hunter Hearst Helmsley was attacked, apparently with a tire iron. We didn't see the perpetrators of the crime. In fact, we didn't even see the victim either. I guess we just have to trust that it really happened. Maybe if Triple H wasn't able to perform due to knee surgery, they should have just shown a tape of almost the exact same angle they ran before the last pay-per-view show. Mark Henry came out. This segment was dying. Finally Henry said he was going home. Finally McMahon came out, and Henry was so bad that McMahon was a welcome addition at this point. It basically announced that on this TV show, that Austin would wrestle Henry in a non-title cage match. B. Jeff and Matt Hardy beat Men's Teo, Takeo Otsuka, and Shoichi Fanaki in 334. Jim Cornette was working his butt off, okay, bad analogy, trying to get the Hardy Boys over. They certainly worked hard although worked like acrobatic indie guys. Jeff missed a somersault dive out of the ring using his brother's back as a springboard. He got up and was fully recovered way too quickly, but then again, when you've only got 3.30 to make an impression, that's just how it is. Finish saw both Hardys come off the top rope onto Funaki and Jeff pinned him. Good. See, in yet another triple threat match, they wound up being both members of DOA against Billy Gunn for 3.17. This was to send the obvious message. Two jobber brothers working together pretty much annihilated the big star. Two-on-ones are usually easy heat for a babyface, but not this time. Even with the DX member in there, the crowd could have cared less. Evidently they weren't the only ones, because it was never even made clear who won, as the only important thing was that Billy lost. My notes say 8-ball won, but who can tell those guys apart? At this point there were problems in the back. China, who Henry in that terrible interview, said was his girlfriend insert your own joke here, I'm saving mine for Nitro, was kicking the hell out of Mark Henry. When she was pulled off, Henry started laughing like he enjoyed it. So then she hit him in the back with a tire iron, pulled up her shorts and rubbed her ass in Henry's race, and told him to kiss it. Bet he enjoyed that too. Anyway, because of that, the cage match with Austin didn't take place. I enjoyed that. So McMahon was in there talking again and a crew member locked the cage door, took off his disguise. Wouldn't you know it. It was Austin and he beat up McMahon for a few seconds in the cage. Undertaker and Kane climbed in and Austin climbed out and escaped. McMahon yelled at both of them for arriving late. Real good angle. When the show ended, McMahon did yet another interview guaranteeing Austin would lose the title. 1. Owen Hart pinned Edge, Adam Copeland, in 918. Hart wore a Toronto Argonauts jersey, they are the rivals in the Canadian Football League of the local Hamilton Tiger Cats, to make sure he got the heel reaction since usually he gets a face reaction in Ontario. The funny part about that is Hart was wearing the jersey of a team from 30 miles away and was booed for it, while Edge was cheered mainly because he was announced from Toronto the same nearby city. 
it may not make sense if you think about it, but both got the reaction they were designed to get as much as was going to happen in a pay-per-view match with no build-up at all. Hart did a real good job of carrying Edge to probably the best technical match on the show. At one point Edge turned a rocker dropped into a hurricane rana. Edge came running off the apron to the floor but Hart caught him and power slammed him. Hart delivered a missile drop kick for a near fall. Edge looked green, but was being carried well, and was willing to take a lot of risks. They continued to trade big moves and near falls the highlight of which was Edge breaking a sharpshooter and doing a quick inside cradle for a near fall. Finish saw a mysterious man show up at ringside, Jay Resso, better known as Christian Cage, a longtime tag partner of Edge when he was Sexton Hardcastle working indies in Canada and Michigan. Edge was distracted and Hart got him from behind with a Japanese rolling crotch cradle for the pin. Two and three quarter stars. Two. Al Snow, Alan Sarvin and Scorpio, Charles Skaggs, beat Brian Christopher, Brian Lawler, and Scott Taylor in 8.05. In time, and not much time, Snow's ring entrance is going to be huge because this is the era of the crowd participation catchphrase. Match was fine. Snow did the Sabu catapult of a chair into that side leg and hip smash. Scorpio tried the same thing but the chair moved, but he made a decent recovery into a low dropkick. Snow did a moonsault off the security rail. Too much were as good as expected, a good working underneath team. Snow made a hot tag and hit everyone with the head, including Scorpio by accident. Snow hit Taylor with a low blow with the head. Christopher came off the top rope with a leg drop, is it the Memphis Jam or the Tennessee Jam let's see, according to my leg drop off the top notes it goes by the state although if a Canadian does it it would to be the province, onto Snow. Scorpio then nailed Christopher, and finally Snow pinned Taylor with a Hokuto Northern Lights bomb, called the Snow Plow. The finishing sequence reads a lot smoother than it looked. Two and one quarter stars. Three. Mark Marrow pinned Darren Drozdov in 5-12. Place totally died. Marrow did a somersault dive out of the ring. Drozdov looked real green and needs to cut down on throwing punches for his comebacks until he learns to do them better. Marrow didn't do a good job of carrying him. Finish saw Jacqueline come off the top with her shoe on Drozdov, and Marrow pinned him with a shooting star press, which they called the Seven Year, oh forget it, the Marrow Suno, now it's the Marvelosity. One quarter of one star. 4. Bradshaw, John Leefield, pinned Vader, Leon White, in 755 in a no DQ falls count anywhere match. Another match with no crowd heat, but damn was it stiff. Bradshaw looks even less charismatic with his new haircut and shave than he did before. Once the people saw him live, they began filing out in rapid order to the bathroom, so the match was killed before it even started. Bradshaw's offense was really stiff. Did I say that before? He mainly did cow out a style shotgun lariats. Bradshaw kicked out of Vader's Vader bomb. Vader kicked out of a sick lariat, but then got clobbered by a second one and Bradshaw got the pin after a neckbreaker. It's amazing because even with the win, Bradshaw still isn't going to get over. Vader needed to have gone on home months ago because this is ridiculous. One and one half star. Five. D'Lo Brown, A.C. Connor, pin gangrel David Heath, in 750. Another dead match. Jerry Lawler made a joke about Canadians being so far behind the times that there was a fan in the audience with a Hulkamania banner. He said it must be someone's grandfather. The only thing funnier than that line is it was delivered by a guy who is doing the exact same gimmick today that he was doing in 1972. After some good short TV matches, Gangrel looked real bad here. Finish saw Henry pull down the ropes and Gangrel, who worked the match as the face although nobody reacted that way, took a bump over. Henry then slammed Gangrel into the post and Brown pinned him after his high power bomb. After the match, Gangrel spit the blood or whatever in Henry's face and used his implant DDT on Brown. One quarter of one star. Six. Rocky Maivia, Dwayne Johnson, won a cage triple threat match over Mankind, Michael Foley, and Ken Shamrock in 1847. Maivia got a huge pop for his appearance on the screens doing his pre-match interview. Mankind did a hilarious interview talking about how the president has put the entire country on hold for a woman that even he would have turned down when he was in high school, and said the biggest joke of all is the people's elbow. You think I'd sell an abortion on a pay-per-view? Crowd was totally for Rocky and at the beginning they didn't seem to care at all about Shamrock, although the crowd turned him heel, which it's been slightly overdue for, as the match wore on. Actually at the beginning they didn't even care about Mankind, but were kind of liking him as the match wore on. There was no pop at all when Shamrock got the ankle lock on Mankind. 
There was a huge pop when Maivia used the float over DDT on Shamrock. Biggest pop of the show was the people's elbow spot. The match started slow and it appeared it was going way too long, but turned out to be very good. Fans started booking Shamrock when he saved mankind after Rocky had put him down with a rock bottom, urinage. There was a surprisingly loud Shamrock sucks chant coming out of this which the announcers played up. Shamrock put the ankle lock on Maivia but Mankind saved just as he was getting ready to tap. Mankind climbed over the top of the cage. Rocky climbed after him and pulled him back to the top and they sat on the cage trading punches a la the famous 1974 spot with Victor Rivera and the Great Goliath. It's a dated reference, but that spot played on the opening of Los Angeles Wrestling for years, but isn't like I didn't see it not only live, but every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. of my childhood. Maivia took a bump into the ring so Mankind could have climbed out. But instead, he stood on top of the cage and gave the Jimmy Snuka sign for the 1983 Don Morocco cage match in Madison Square Garden. He actually came down off the top with an elbow as opposed to a full body splash, and it did miss. Somewhere in all of this Maivia juiced. Shamrock was about to climb out, but Mankind stopped him, but not before Shamrock grabbed a chair as he was being pulled in. Shamrock went for a chair shot but missed. Mankind came back with a chair shot that hit solid. Mankind started climbing out but before he could hit the floor, Maivia recovered and crawled over pinning Shamrock for the win. After the match Shamrock went nuts again. Three and one half stars. 7. Val Venus, Sean Morley, pinned Dustin Runnels in 909. Venus brought out Terry Botright Runnels, Dustin's real-life wife in a pretty revealing blue negligee. Terry Runnels looked like a washed-up porn star, although she looked a lot better the next night on Raw. Despite how great the angle is between the two once they started wrestling, there was no heat at all. Venus even on TV gets great heat for his ring entrance but little for his wrestling. Runnels' gimmick is dead, but it's almost over anyway. Runnels worked harder than he's done of late, but even though he's only 29, he's taken so much punishment from so many years in, that he's a lot slower and less mobile and has fallen greatly from his working prime, which in reality was many years ago. He tried to take his spin bump off a clothesline on the floor but couldn't get the full spin. He was dropped face first on the announcing table. From a storyline standpoint, Runnels should be the face but he isn't. Which also may be why the angle didn't get any heat. Venus reversed a superplex and dropped Dustin face first onto the apron. Venus and Terry started making out. Runnels came back with a bulldog and for whatever reason, Venus forgot to kick out, and the ref held up the count. Even thought the crowd favorite was saved it was such a screw up the entire place started booing heavily. Venus finally won with a power slam and his money shot finisher. Three quarters of a star. 8. X-Pac, Sean Waltman, and New Age Outlaws, Brian James and Monty Sop, beat Jeff Jarrett and Dennis Knight and Mark Canterbury in 11:15. Most of the match saw the heels work over X-Pac which was good since X-Pac can work. However, this didn't get heat largely because everyone was paying more attention to a fight in the stands. When he made the hot tag to gun, it didn't look so good but it also didn't last long. Jim Ross was trying like crazy to get gun over as the best athlete in the WWF, Although I've got no idea what he's ever done in or out of the ring to garner that praise other than they are trying to push him as a single because they are short singles heels. Well, we know he's never done anything in the ring other than say suck it, and I'm not sure that takes tremendous athletic ability. Jarrett brought in the guitar. Gun got it. The ref got it. Canterbury clotheslined X-Pac over the top. Jarrett got the guitar from the ref and clocked X-Pac with it. X-Pac sold it as if a splinter got in his eye. In the ring, gun pinned Knight after a rocker dropper. One and three quarter stars. Nine. There was no winner in the main event, but one loser, Steve Austin, Steve Williams, against Undertaker, Mark Calloway, Hayne, Glenn Jacobs in 2203. Austin hit Undertaker with a chair during Taker's ring entrance and started pounding on Kane with a chair on the aisle. When Undertaker finally recovered, Austin whipped him into the ring steps knees first. Austin was beating on Kane some more until Undertaker saved him. Kane then sold the beating and Austin fought Undertaker for a while. Heat was real disappointing after months of great build-up between Austin and Undertaker, and a good month for this match in specific. I think it was more because the show was too long at this point because while there was nothing special with the work in the match, there was nothing wrong with it either. Taker accidentally hit Kane when Austin ducked, and Austin kicked Taker who collided with Kane. Austin choked Kane with the TV cables and Taker choked Austin with the cables, both dropped Austin face first on the Spanish announcer's table. In the ring Undertaker and Kane began destroying Austin for several minutes and he'd make brief comebacks but be cut off. 
The first actual heat for the match was the pop when Gerald Briscoe, Pat Patterson and Sergeant Slaughter came out. Austin wound up in the aisle and jumped on Briscoe, and Slaughter put the boots to him. Taker and Kane dragged a limp Austin back to the ring and started pounding on him. The crowd was totally dead at this point and the match was dragging on way too long. The big spot came when Austin hit Kane with a chair, but Taker hit Austin with a chair and went to pin him, but Kane saved Austin. Then when Kane went to pin Austin, Undertaker saved Austin. Taker and Kane started fighting and Austin even helped Kane double on Undertaker. Finally, Austin tried a stunner on Kane, who blocked it and shoved Austin into the high kick of Undertaker. Both guys choke slammed Austin and pinned him at the same time. Vince got the belt and ran away, jumping into a limo with the motor running. Apparently Austin was supposed to run after him as they did the getaway, but Austin's knee must have been out because he only walked. So McMahon's car couldn't leave until Austin who was beating on Patterson, Slaughter and Briscoe to get his heat back after the loss, got there so he could taunt him as the show went off the air. People did not leave the arena happy. Two and one quarter stars. As expected, Scott Norton became only the third American ever, and first in more than seven years, to win the IWGP heavyweight title when he scored the pin on unlikely main event opponent Yuji Nagata on the New Japan Big Wednesday show on September 23rd at the Yokohama Arena before 14,000 fans. Even thought he crowd was the smallest ever and I believe the first non-sellout for New Japan in the 17,010 seat arena for its annual Big September show, the show had a weak advance and the feeling was that Booker Ricky Choshu successfully, in just two weeks on this tour made a new superstar in Nagata. Norton whose first title defense was scheduled for October 30th in Hiroshima against Shinya Hashimoto. Norton suffered a legit knee injury in the Nagata match and we don't know how serious it is at press time. He joins only Hulk Hogan, who was the first champion in history back in 1983, and Big Van Vader, who held the title on three occasions between 1989 and 1991, as Americans to have held New Japan's premier singles title. One other foreigner has held the title, the seven-week reign of Russian Salman Hashimakov in 1989. In the 26-year history of the New Japan promotion, the only other Americans who have ever held the group's top heavyweight title were Johnny Powers, who came to Japan as NWF World Heavyweight Champion to drop it to Antonio Inoki, and Stan Hansen, who held the NWF World title for two months in 1980. Ken Shamrock was actually slated to win the title in 1997, but opted instead to sign with the WWF and his bookings in Japan were cancelled. Just as Shamrock's reign never happened, Norton, who it appeared was supposed to win the title earlier this year but the New Japan slash WCW relations worsened over problems with New Japan and Sonny Wanu, the WCW liaison in the deal, probably wasn't supposed to win it at this point but it happened due to the injury of Masahiro Chono. Nagata took Chono's place. Chono's long-awaited first-ever title reign was cut short after just six weeks, when his chronic neck problems worsened to the point he could no longer get in the ring. After the tag team match on September 19th in Nagoya, Chono's left leg was totally numb and he couldn't even climb stairs, stemming from a herniated disc in his neck. Chono was forced to vacate the title, and while nothing is a certainty, the belief is now that he won't be able to return to action until December or January, although New Japan is hoping for a November return. On this tour, Nagata scored the two biggest wins of his career en route to he and Kensuke Sasaki winning New Japan's tag team tournament. First they won a non-title match over IWGP tag champs Genichiro Tenryu and Shiro Koshinaka when he scored his first career pin on Koshinaka, and then won the tournament itself on September 21st in Osaka beating Hashimoto and Kazuo Yamazaki when he made Yamazaki via submission with an armbar. Live reports indicate that the fans in attendance in Yokohama believed it would be Nagata's night. Despite the fact that Nagata has only been a pushed commodity for two weeks while Norton has been a headliner in Japan and more often than not, the company's top foreign star, since his debut in late 1990, it was estimated that half the crowd actually believed Nagata would win and virtually the entire crowd was heavily behind him. Much of the match consisted of Norton playing Monster Foreigner, popping up from much of Nagata's offense until Nagata caught him in a Sankakujum, triangle head scissors and armbar, which most of the crowd believed was going to be the finish, particularly due to the great job Sasaki did at ringside acting as if he was about to jump into the ring for the celebration. However, Norton broke the move, and then delivered a powerbomb and two clothesline for the win in 1304. At that point, all the NWO members, Keiji Muto, Hiroyoshi Tenzan, Hiro Saito, NWO Sting and Brian Adams, hit the ring for a post-match celebration. The Yokohama show which was attended by Eric Bischoff and Sonny Wanu, wasn't expected to sell out even if Chono hadn't been hurt because of the format of WCW wrestlers, who aren't big draws in Japan, headlining and challenging for all four of the IWGP titles. 
Adams and NWO Sting, isn't that name rather stupid today when the original Sting is part of the NWO lost to Tenryu and Koshinaka when Tenryu pinned Sting after a lariat in a match described as being as bad as you'd think. Jushin Liger retained the IWGP junior title beating Kaz Hayashi, who had Ultimo Dragon and Dragon Kid in his corner. Hayashi looked good with his flying but in a long match people could see he still had a ways to go in being able to carry a singles match so overall this was said to be below the caliber of most of Liger's single bouts. Liger won using his Shota, palm thrust, for the pin. Fans were impressed by Hayashi's flying. The other title match saw Shinjiro Otani and Tatsuhito Takaiwa retain their IWGP Junior Tag Team titles beating Black Tiger, Eddie Guerrero, and Chris Jericho in 1932 when Otani pinned Tiger with a dragon suplex in what we were told was a really good match, although live reports said Otani stood out above the other three. The other top match on the show was a singles match where Shinya Hashimoto pinned Keiji Muto in 2037 of what we were told was a very good match with a DDT. Bischoff got in the ring and made the announcement that Sasaki and Nagata would challenge for the WCW tag team titles, and both came into the ring to shake hands with Bischoff. Bischoff never said who the WCW tag team champs were, nor when or where the match would take place. Bischoff had meetings with New Japan during his brief stay largely on the subject of pay-per-view. Right now there are 600,000 pay-per-view homes in Japan as opposed to about 35 million in the United States and Canada. Neither All Japan nor New Japan have even attempted to do a pay-per-view, however several of the smaller groups have with not much in the way of real success, although last year's Hicks and Gracie vs. Nobuiko Takata KRS Pride 1 show did do an 8.0 buy rate in the limited universe. Both WCW and ECW pay-per-view events from the US are now airing live in Japan with a price tag of about $10.50 as opposed to the $29.95 and $19.95 respectively that they go for in the US. ECW for the first time on November 1st, which actually airs in Japan on the morning on November 2nd, on pay-per-view, as did the K1 show from Las Vegas. At this point, WWF pay-per-view shows aren't airing in Japan. New Japan is in the planning stages of putting its big shows on pay-per-view, and also wants the UFO shows on pay-per-view to give that company credibility as a different entity so that eventually they can work the interpromotional angle. Before the Yokohama Arena show at 2.58 p.m., they did a parking lot angle where UFO's top star, Naoya Ogawa, jumped Don Fry. The idea is that Fry is supposed to be part of UFO and UFO boss Antonio Inoki said that he didn't like the idea of Fry doing tag team matches because a real martial arts fighter doesn't appear in tag team matches. Ogawa actually used a judo hip toss on the parking lot pavement on Fry, who later that day went through with his tag match, said to be bad, teaming with Igor Minder to lose to Sasaki and Yamazaki. This angle is to set up UFO's debut show on October 24th in Tokyo with Ogawa vs. Fry continuing their rivalry on top. The entire wrestling business in Japan is rapidly changing due to the emergence of cable and pay-per-view will also bring about a change when the number of homes increase, although the belief is that because cable itself for zoning reasons will never become big in Japan, it's mainly a small dish business in its infancy than actual cable as in the US pro wrestling fans may make up the highest concentration of those purchasing small dishes, because not only do they air many of the smaller groups in Japan that don't have regular television, but Nitro Raw, WCW Worldwide and ECW as well. Of the four, Raw is by far the most popular in Japan. This has changed the face of wrestling in Japan. For example, when New Japan announced the tournament, they were told, since there is no such thing as long-term planning, by WCW officials that Sting and Kevin Nash would be tag champs and announce them as such, even though by the time the announcement was made, the newspapers in Japan and those who have dishes that watch Nitro knew about Giant and Scott Hall as champs. Many average casual wrestling fan of New Japan know far more about what is going on in the United States than the people running the sister company, although this could also be said in the US as far as wrestling fans understanding Japanese wrestling more than those who had WCW and WWF do. Another example pertains to Eddie Guerrero. Guerrero was something of a junior heavyweight star for years as Black Tiger, a name that goes back in Japanese wrestling to the original, Mark Hussey aka Rollerball Mark Rocco. That feuded with the original Tiger Mask back in 1982 and before that to the character in the Tiger Mask television cartoon. However, to today's fans who see Nitro on TV and see the magazines, Black Tiger is the name from years ago and Eddie Guerrero is the star today. However, the company, not aware of the penetration of Nitro, still used Guerrero as Black Tiger figuring their fans don't know anything that the company itself doesn't present to them.
There were no major surprises in the first round of the annual K1 Grand Prix tournament held on September 27 before a sellout crowd of 38,820 at the Osaka Dome aside from setting an all-time record TV audience for the promotion. The show aired as a two-hour primetime special on the Fuji Network and drew a 22.8 rating, breaking the record set for last year's Grand Prix Finals from the Tokyo Dome. The rating was even more impressive since the sports audience was somewhat fractionalized by a major Yomiuri Giants baseball game going head-to-head and doing a 15.7 rating. It is said that K1 beating the Yomiuri Giants would be considered equivalent in the US to Raw or Nitro beating Monday Night Football. It made K1 the 13th highest rated show of the week in Japan, and the third highest rated sporting event trailing two of the sumo events in a major tournament that was doing killer ratings all week, although K1 actually beat the sumo tournament finals that did a 21.3. The show determined the final eight competitors to go to the K1 Grand Prix Finals on December 13th at the Tokyo Dome. All of the top K1 stars were given opponents they should have, and in fact did, handle. Peter Ertz knocked out Sanisha Andreikovic in 155 of the second round, in the only first-round match that figured to be hard to pick, Stefan Liko won a five-round decision over Ray Sefo. Sam Greco beat Matt Skelton by decision after five. Francisco Filio, he of the very suspicious series of wins last year, knocked out American Grand Prix winner Rick Rufus in 15 seconds of the third round taking his leg out with a low kick. Andy Hug beat Mark Russell by a knockout as he put him down just before the bell sounded to end the second round so the knockout was actually at 3.07 of round two. Russell apparently gave Hug a tougher fight than what was expected. Mike Bernardo beat Maurice Smith by a decision. Ernesto Hust beat Tosca the King of Sting in a knockout at three minutes of the fourth round, while in the only match on the show described as being not good, Masaaki Sadake won a five-round decision of Greub Fitoza. The Tokyo Dome show, barring any injury pullouts, will have first-round matches of Ertz vs. Sadake, Filio vs. Bernardo, Hug vs. Sefo, and Hust vs. Greco. There is some question regarding Filio and Sadake. Filio's karate organization wants him back competing under their auspices rather than in K1 competition. Sadake suffered a serious cut above the left eye and had to be hospitalized. One would think the final four would be Ertz vs. Bernardo and Hust vs. Hug, a rematch of last year's finals. Due to a computer problem at Nielsen, the ratings for September 28th didn't come out until after the close of business on September 29th. All the information we have at press time is that Raw did a 4.6 rating and Nitro did a 4.0, and that Raw won most, if not all the quarters until the final one. Nitro with Hogan against both Bret Hart and later Sting beat Raw's final quarter with Undertaker and Kane vs. Rock and Ken Shamrock and Mankind, although we don't have any other details other than WCW supposedly won that final quarter by a big margin. WCW was lucky it was that close as Raw was an excellent show and came in with a lot of intrigue over who was the champion coming out of the pay-per-view. Answer was nobody, as WWF announced its October 18th Chicago pay-per-view main event as Undertaker vs. Kane for the vacant title with Steve Austin as ref. One would presume, with Undertaker having just done two clean jobs, one for Austin at SummerSlam, and the other in the tag for Rocky Maivia on September 28th, that Undertaker would somehow wind up with the title coming out of that match and this would set Maivia up as the challenger for that title at Survivor Series. Nitro wasn't good, but it didn't get beaten any worse in the ratings because they did a good job for the entire show building up the first ever Hogan vs. Hart match. This ended up going seven minutes, with Hart carried away after Hogan mainly worked on his bad knee, and then Hart limping back and turning on Sting as he had Hogan in the Scorpion. Nitro was a mess by the end of the show, as it went off the air three minutes before the hour because Hogan, Sting and Hart ended their angle way too early, they actually sent Conan and Lex Luger back out to try and stall to keep action going, while Raw had nine minutes unopposed going off at 11.06pm with the three on two which ended when Maivia pinned Undertaker clean with the rock bottom. The combined rating was impressive because not only did it have competition from first-run network programming and football like every other week, but also the Cubs-Giants playoff game. Japanese Television Rundown September 14th Pancrase This was the company's fifth anniversary show from Tokyo Budokan Hall and its second pay-per-view show. Overall I'd rate this as an improvement over the first pay-per-view show, although still a thumbs in the middle show and nowhere even close to the level of its third anniversary show, the final pay-per-view show in the US in 1996, which was the best show in company history. The problem with the product is that the fighters are generally, like with UFC, far more skilled than in its infancy, particularly in submission awareness. In the submission game, going against a foe that doesn't know the game well, 
it leads to cool submission finishes. When you have two people who are well-trained experts at the game, it becomes something of a long drawn out chess match and is a higher level product, but a far less entertaining one, particularly since most of the competitors were fairly evenly matched. On this show, you had some of the best submission fighters in the world, and in eight matches, you didn't have one match end via submission, and there was only one submission hold that turned out to be dangerous all night. 1. Manabu Yamada, 12 9 and 2, drew with Katsomi Inagaki, 14 16 and 3, after 10 minutes regulation time and a 3 minutes overtime. The guys traded some knees standing but most of the match was on the mat and either ever came close to putting the other away or even having them in trouble. A typical Pankrace human chess match. All three judges ruled the match a draw, and since there was never anyone in real trouble, it was the only decision one could come to. 2. Jason Delusha, 24 and 11, beat Satoshi Hasegawa, 12 14 and 1, via a majority decision after 10 minutes regulation and 3 minutes overtime. Delusha had a reach and weight 198 to 167 advantage and used it to dominate. They had a few good exchanges standing. At one point Hasegawa went down from open hands, and it was first called a knockdown which would have been the difference in the match, but later ruled as a slip. It was debatable either way as Delusha hit him, but didn't stun him and he lost balance and went down. Delusha was in the mount and totally dominant from the 5 minutes to 9.30 mark and had two near submissions. In the overtime, Delusha wound up on top again. This was a good match. Delusha was awarded a 30-29 win by two judges and the other ruled it a 30-30 draw. I saw it as a pretty clear win by Delusha. 3. Evan Tanner, 4-0, beat Kyuma Kunyoku, 11-11 and 4, via a 2-0 score after 20 minutes to take Kunyoku's number 6 ranking. Tanner, who had a 28-pound weight advantage, 204-176, and is a great wrestler, used his wrestling skill early. Kunyoku was constantly trying something from the bottom. While standing Tanner rocked Kunyoku with a few knees and got a knockdown at 440 for his first point. He got his second point at 532 with his headlock choke near the ropes, but Kunyoku escaped by grabbing. Kunyoku connected on some slaps and Tanner on some knees before Tanner took him down again. Kunyoku was bleeding from the mouth but still trying things from the bottom as he couldn't take Tanner down, nor block his takedowns. Tanner got a front guillotine at 1130 but Kunyoku escaped. Kunyoku nearly got an ankle lock at 14 minutes and 17.50 as Tanner was starting to look a lot more human as he was taken past the 10 minutes mark for the first time in his career. Decent match. 4. Yuki Kondo, 25 and 3, retained his number 2 ranking beating Asami Shibuya, 16 19 and 6, by a decision after 20 minutes. This match was almost entirely on the mat and there were no close calls. It was similar to the first match in that it was more a ground chess game that wasn't very entertaining. There was a spot where Shibuya caught a Kondo kick, and Kondo actually flipped up and delivered a pro wrestling in Zudri, but of course that doesn't work, at least in that form, in real life and Shibuya didn't sell it. Shibuya was more aggressive and on top most of the way. Two judges voted 30-29 for Kondo and the other voted 30-29 for Shibuya. Kondo got a gift on this one. Shibuya could have won via decision, although since there were no close calls a draw would probably be the fair decision, but no way Shibuya should have lost. 5. Boss Rutan, 25-4-1, beat Kengo Watanabe, 0-1, via TKO in 258 after scoring three knockdowns. This was definitely different than boxing in the US where they protect young guys who are thought to have potential. Everyone is high on Watanabe, but they started him off against one of the best fighters in the world and he didn't have the experience. This was a basic slugfest and Rutan had more firepower, although Watanabe did connect on him. Rutan put him down first with knees and open hands. Watanabe came out of the first exchange with a bloody nose, and before long had a cut at the hairline and a fat lip, that kept getting worse as Rutan kept connecting. Rutan put him down two more times to win. An exciting match and Watanabe got over big with the crowd because he never lost his desire and went right at Rutan's strengths and never backed up. 6. Yashiki Takahashi 13-13-2 beat Minoru Suzuki 23-17, in 8.06 via TKO. Most of this match was standing and Takahashi really pounded Suzuki silly. He was connecting on him with open hands to the head again and again. Suzuki was stunned and the ref called for a standing 8 count and Suzuki was pissed about the call but it was the right call. Pretty brutal and one of the more exciting Pankrace matches of the year. Suzuki who was one of the best in the infancy of the style, has never been the same since being knocked out by Guy Mesger in 1996 and this was brutal all the hard shots he was taking without being able to defend his head. 
he really needs to retire. Takahashi continued pounding on him and got two more knockdowns to stop the fight. 7. Semishult 9-7, beat Masakatsu Funaki, 37 and 10, via KO in 7-13. Schult who was billed at 6 foot 11, and that looks legit, just has too much reach on everyone and now that he's got experience in knowing how to use his height in this style of fighting, he's awfully hard to beat, as he even beat Mezger in June. Funaki couldn't stand with him because of the reach, and Schult has become an expert at connecting with brutal knees when wrestlers try and take him down. Funaki tried to stand with him and got nowhere. Funaki had beaten him twice before but both were because of his submission skill. But when you can't get a guy down, it nullifies where Funaki's expertise is. He tried to shoot and took a hard knee, and then took a second knee for a knockdown at 5.17 so that made him reconsider that strategy. Funaki was given a standing 8 from a hard knee and an open hand. Schultz started with low kicks, connected again with a knee that rocked Funaki, and hit a body punch and Funaki went down for the count. Since that was a 20 minutes time limit and opposed to 15 minutes for the two previous matches, Funaki could have continued had he gotten up, but he couldn't beat the 10 count. Funaki never got into his game. 8. Guy Mezger 15 6 and 2, retained the King of Pancrase title beating Ryushi Yanagisawa 21 13 and 5, via 2 to 0 score after 30 minutes. These two had four previous matches, with Mezger winning three, once by choke, once by knockout, and once by decision and the other being a draw. Mezger, who is really underrated as an all-around fighter, totally dominated this match. He was in control the entire way standing which is impressive since Yanagisawa has fought professionally as a kickboxer. He also totally out-wrestled and out-grappled Yanagisawa on the ground. It wasn't super exciting, but it was a very impressive performance to me as you had two guys fighting without a break for 30 minutes and neither got tired or lost their heart or guts. Yanagisawa deserves a ton of credit as it couldn't be easy to be largely beaten up on for 30 minutes and never mentally quitting, particularly since it never appeared he had any chance to win and he was bloody and being pounded on. Mezger knocked him down at 145 with a knee and was very aggressive in trying to end the match throwing knees and high kicks and getting a second knockdown at 308. Mezger kept pounding on him standing but Yanagisawa wouldn't go down. Mezger finally took him down and went for a choke but Yanagisawa got away. Mezger largely punished him in the corner with a lot of body blows most of the way, so it was similar to the match in April where he won the title from Funaki. He nearly got another choke at 14 minutes. Yanagisawa was bleeding from the mouth and got rocked again with knees, open hands and high kicks at 16.20 but somehow survived and didn't go down. Mezger took him down again and dominated him. Mezger nearly put him out again at 22 minutes with a side kick. Yanagisawa had another ugly sliver cut opened above his left eye, fans booed a lot in the last minute and at the end. In that way it was pretty strange for Japanese fans who rarely boo unless something is real bad and neither fighter deserved that reaction. Both guys showed a ton of heart and it wasn't as if they were stalling or not fighting. They may have been disappointed since the fighter they wanted to win did virtually nothing on offense. Mexico September 25th at Arena Mexico drew approximately 12,000 fans for the double hair versus hair match with Mascara Año 2000 and Emilio Charles Jr. beating El Boricua and Ricky Santana. They teased an angle with ref babe Richard turning heel. After Boricua had submitted, in a tag match in Mexico you have to beat both members of the team to win the fall Santana kicked 2000 low and pinned him. They made it so you didn't know if Richard saw the foul or not. As Santana is playing to the crowd, Charles sneaks in and schoolboyed him. As the other ref, Kigra Hispano, counted to three, Richard put his hands over his face like it went against his plan. Finish got over huge and the local papers really praised Santana's work, and Santana and Boricua got shaved at the end. But the biggest news on the show was the return of Pierre Roth Jr., who left EMLL as its top heel in 1995 to join AAA in such a bitter falling out that both sides made it clear they would never do business again. It was Rayo de Jalisco Jr. and Head Hunters against Steel of Alvinas and CN Cars and Universo 2000. The match was terrible, as you'd suspect, when Pierre Roth came from out of the crowd to attack Rayo for the outside interference DQ. TV announcer Dr. Alfonso Morales interviewed Pierre Roth and started screaming at him trying to act as if he invaded, you know, the interpromotional deal. Pierre Roth then began choking Morales, who was not only the longtime wrestling announcer but among the most famous mainstream sports announcers in Mexico and who rarely if ever has been a participant in an angle. Fans started pelting the ring with garbage and it got so much heat it was described as a mini-riot. Pieroth and Steele then hugged and Pieroth once again attacked Ryo. D to make Pieroth even more of a heel, after the main event, 
he came out to console the Puerto Rican team, thus going against the Mexicans. Radamez Coco who is promoting the October 24th pay-per-view show, had announced the day before that Pierre Roth would be on his show. In the expected best match on the show, El Eo Del Santo and Felino and Negro Casas beat Dr. Wagner Jr. and Scorpio Jr. and Fuerza Guerrera. At this point in the storyline, Santo and Casas are friends and work together, but Santo and Felino have teamed but haven't fully buried the hatchet. Box E Lucha this week had an interesting set of stats saying that Santo is now 51 0 in matches with his mask at stake, but Rio is 53 0. The 45th anniversary of the pro debut of Raul Reyes on September 19 at Arena Coliseo was headlined by Los Hermanos Dinamita beating Mil Mascaras and Santo and Rayo via DQ. October 2 at Arena Mexico has Pierre Roth and Apollo Dantes and Mascara Año 2000 vs. Charles and Rayo and Atlantis, Santo and Felino and La Fiera vs. Scorpio Jr. and Fuerza Guerrera and Bestia Salvaje and Shocker and Headhunters vs. Boricua and Santana and Grand Marcus Jr. After hinting last week that due to the peso falling, he'd have to cut one of the foreigners, Paco Alonso this week ended up sending everyone home except the headhunters, who are in demand by promoters all over Mexico so he can sell their services at a good price, despite coming off some of his best houses of the year. Ricky Santana and El Boricua were scheduled to stay until December as part of the deal to give up their hair but were told this week they'd be finishing up. Kevin Quinn and Blue Blazer Jr. have already been sent home. It appears his feeling is with Pierre Roth back. He can use him as the top heel and doesn't need foreigners that get paid in more expensive US dollars on a guarantee. Former AAA mini star La Parquita is now the lead singer of a rock band called El Grupo Hollywood. And yes, he performs with the parka mask. My AAA summer scandal show on September 18th in Ciudad Madero saw Heavy Metal and Blue Demon Jr. beat Kickboxer and Abismo Negro in a Tirantes, real name Cruz Reyes, had to be the slave for one week for Guicho Dominguez real name Carlos Bonvades. Negro was about to climb out to win, but had lost so much blood that when he was at the top, he collapsed and fell into the ring. Every night this week on the Duro e Directo show, a show that's huge particularly with teenage girls because of the Brennan brothers, they have clips of Dominguez humiliating Tarantes. On September 28, Dominguez made Tarantes wear a dress and parade through downtown Mexico City. In the women's hair versus hair incredibles match, Miss Janeth and Aldo Moreno beat Shochito Hamada and Rossi Moreno when Rossi was pinned by Hamada and had her head shaved. Brasso de Plata may have suffered a mild heart attack on September 22 at Arena Coliseo. The deal is that he is known for working heart attack spots into his matches because he's had two legitimate heart attacks and weighs more than 310 pounds on a 5 foot 4 frame. It was reported that he passed out after his match and Parata Morgan gave him CPRL Cigna was thrown onto his head while horseback riding and is out of action with double vision. Mr. Nyebola who holds both the CMLL tag titles, with Shocker, and Trios, with Atlantis and Lismark, was told by the commission doctor that they'll pull his license until his knee can pass the physical. La Parca and Parata Morgan are feuding in Monterey over the IWC heavyweight title. Brasso de Oro's son is wrestling under the name Lethal, until he gets experience when he'll get a Brasso name. Former foreign draw Salomon Grundy and Fabulosi Blondie, Ken Timms who got over big because they were there doing foreign gimmicks when television first hit Mexico City so they were among the first round of TV made foreign stars, are said to be headed back to Arena Mexico toward the end of the year. AAA has been running shows in Tijuana. September 25th was Octagon and Pero Aguayo and Blue Demon Jr. vs. Fuhrer and Sangre Chicana and El Hijo del Enfermero plus a Mexican national middleweight title match with Abismo Negro vs. Pentagon. October 2nd has Pero Aguayo Jr. and Sr. vs. Chicana and Enfermero for the Mexican national tag team titles. All the big shows in Mexico the weekend of September 18th through September 20th were down both due to the De La Hoya fight and even more because of flooding in Mexico City. The newspaper Ovasianis reported that Blue Blazer Jr., Phil Lafon, had really put on weight since his arrival three weeks ago from too much vitamin T, tacos, tortillas and tostadas, at the restaurant owned by former wrestler Babe Face. Fantasma and the commission are giving major heat to Mr. Aguila. Since losing his mask on September 11th, he has been working with heavy and complete face paint a la his Papichulo WWF character. Fantasma, who heads the commission, said he feels doing so is a violation of the spirit of losing a mask versus mask match. Guardian and official and vigilante captured the state of Mexico trio's titles on September 27 in now call upon from Shima Nobunaga and Judo Suwa and Sumo Fuji. All Japan, very little new as they open the new tour this coming weekend. Mitsuharu Misawa is having far more influence on the booking. 
while he had influence before he is now booking instead of Giant Baba officially and Matoka Baba, Giant Baba's wife, has largely been eliminated from the creative end, although not the business end, which may result in a lessening of the push for Johnny Ace and Monokia Mossman. It was Baba's idea to make Mossman into Misawa's partner, but Misawa felt that Mossman was too green for that spot and it wound up being Yoshinari Ogawa. Misawa himself wanted it to be Masahito Kakihara, but Ogawa wound up as the compromise candidate as Baba still doesn't understand the appeal of small Kakihara as a shooter gimmick as he's always been a big man promoter figuring the public believes the big guys are really the strongest and toughest based on his own lengthy career. There is a lot of hope that Misawa can come up with ideas so all Japan will get with it, both in terms of booking and product but also in terms of modernizing the pay scale and the treatment of the talent. One point of contention is the treatment of the outside talent when they work here. When Baba uses guys like Ghetto and Jato or Super Delphin, he uses them low on the card, they work all Japan style, and they are treated as equivalent or lesser than the all Japan underneath talent. Misawa wanted to work a singles match with Jinsei Shinzaki on the next tour to attempt to elevate Shinzaki by making him look competitive before losing, since Misawa shouldn't lose as he's getting a title shot at the end of the tour. Even though Delphin is a star in Japan, the idea is that he's just a minor leaguer in all Japan and can't even beat Baba's underneath guys except his rookies. Senator Hiroshi Hase, who had the potential to draw money against all the top guys, was similarly treated and even though he had great singles matches with Jun Akiyama and Kenna Kobashi, he's yet to score a big win and nobody actually takes him as a threat to the top guys which wasted his acquisition. He's using the logic that you don't beat your own guys with outsiders. The more modern approach is to let outsiders, who are untouched against your guys, win up until the level they can draw money, and then work interpromotional programs that draw money rather than use them to fill out the show and not let them rise to the money-drawing level. These points are even more important now because the top of the shows are stale, and it's the same matchups, albeit they are sometimes great matches. There was a time where it was considered that All Japan was the best job in wrestling, but every other major company has improved working conditions over the past six or seven years and All Japan hasn't changed a thing, and really, in many ways things have gotten worse and Baba is becoming like a Bob Geigel or a Vern Gagne as the old style of promoting and treating talent got passé. The last show of the year, which is the Tag Team Tournament Finals, will be December 5th at Budokan Hall. September 13th TV show did a 4.2 rating. New Japan They are now saying that Osamu Nishimura has a non-cancerous stomach tumor that has to be removed and will be out of action for the rest of the year. I'm not sure if that's legit, or if they are using that as a cover reason because he moved back to Germany against New Japan's wishes. Even though Satoshi Kojima was thought to be out for the rest of the year after eye surgery, he'll actually return on October 18th. The UFO offshoot of this promotion debuts on October 24th at Tokyo Sumo Hall with something of a UFC workers' reunion. The top matches are Naoi Ogawa vs. Don Fry, Brian Johnston vs. Gerard Gordeau, Mark Hall vs. Joe Charles and Jason Blaze vs. Orlando Vite. Satoru Sayama will be heading up the promotion of this show since Antonio Inoki is spending most of his time living in Los Angeles. Inoki wanted to use Kendo Kashin, Tokamitsu Ishizawa and Kazuyuki Fujita from New Japan on the show since they are basically his protégés, however New Japan has a major show the same day in Fukuoka and Kashin is booked in a title match. Anyway, I don't see how this lineup can draw at Sumo Hall, but TBS in Japan is promoting as heavily since it'll air as a TV special. The TV taping shows on the upcoming tour, which they are billing as the NWO Typhoon Tour, and are acting like it's being promoted by the NWO as opposed to New Japan. All the officials have to get different stickers, etc., and they make it like Masahiro Chono is running everything and lineups are October 9th in Koryama, Tatsumi Fujinami and Shinya Hashimoto in Kensuke Sasaki vs. Keiji Muto and NWO Sting and Brian Adams, Manabu Nakanishi and Fujita vs. Yuji Nagata and Kazuo Yamazaki, Jushin Liger and El Samurai and Kashin and Dr. Wagner Jr. vs. Koji Kanemoto and Tatsuhiro Takaiwa and Shinjiro Atani and Great Sasuke. October 18th in Kobe, Genichiro Tenryu and Shiro Koshinaka defend IWGP tag titles against Muto and Tenzan, Don Fry vs. Akitoshi Saito, Sasuke vs. Samurai, Kojima and Nakanishi vs. Nagata and Takashi Izuka, Wagner vs. Kanemoto, Liger and Kashin vs. Atani and Takaiwa non-title, Hashimoto and Sasaki and Yamazaki vs. NWO, Sting and Adams and Michael Wall Street, October 24th and Fukuoka, Liger vs. Samurai for IWGP Junior title, Hashimoto and Sasaki vs. Scott Norton and Muto, Atani and Takaiwa defend IWGP Junior tag titles against Kashin and Kanemoto, October 26th in Nagasaki, 
Fujinami and Hashimoto and Nagata vs. Norton and Muto and NWO Sting, Sasaki and Yamazaki and Nakanishi vs. Adams and Big Titan and Tenzan, Liger and Wagner and Samurai vs. Kanemoto and Atani and Takaiwa, and finishing up October 30th in Hiroshima, Norton vs. Hashimoto for IWGP heavyweight title, Liger vs. Atani, Kanemoto vs. Takaiwa and Wagner vs. Kashin September 12th TV did a 2.1 rating. Other Japan Notes Version announced its first major show on December 18th at Yokohama Bunka Gym headlined by Asia Kong vs. Ayako Hamada, plus Candy Akutsu vs. Mariko Yoshida to crown the first queen of version, Rosina Alina from Russia, a world-class judo star, who was a shoot tournament in 1996 at Budokan Hall working for all Japan women, faces Reggie Bennett, who she beat during that tournament. Hayabusa defends the two FMW world titles against Koji Nakagawa as the main event on the October 6th Karakuen Hall show. They are doing an angle where Atsushi Onita wants to form a tag team with Hayabusa, but at this point Hayabusa hasn't accepted. On September 23rd in Sakata before 501 fans, in the Mask vs. Mask match trade Sasuke and Tiger Mask beat Sasuke the Great and Mask Tiger when Tiger pin Tiger. Mask Tiger was revealed as Takeshi Ono, of course. Also on September 23rd at Karakuen Hall, they did one of the most bizarre gimmicks ever. Shadow WX, Satoru Shiga, captured the deathmatch title beating Mitsuhiro Matsunaga in one of those matches with beds of nails, barbed wire boards, light bulbs etc. I believe Matsunaga took a bump into the bed of nails to lose. Anyway, the stips were that the loser would then face a live crocodile in a casket match. I guess the crocodile was heavily sedated because he didn't move at all, and Matsunaga got behind him and used a choke on him and put him into the casket. Although somehow with posturing and all, the crocodile match went 5:33. October 4th Pancrase at Karakuen Hall has Kengo Watanabe vs. Jason Godzi as the main event, which is interesting because everyone is high on Watanabe's potential, and they sure aren't giving him pushovers early in his career. Other matches are Yuki Kondo vs. Daisuke Ishii, Asami Shibuya vs. Katsumi Inagaki and Satoshi Hasegawa vs. Kusei Kubota and Ikui Zaminoa vs. Travis Fulton, a veteran of extreme challenge who has something like 50 MMA fights in the Midwest. Takaku Fuk is off the show with two injured elbows, while Yoshiki Takahashi apparently suffered a broken right orbital bone last week in training. War and LLPW promoted a joint mixed tag team tournament at Karakuen Hall on September 27. The first round matches took place on the War afternoon show while semi-finals and finals took place that evening at the LLPW show. Finals saw Yuji Yasurioka and Yasha Kurenai beat Koki Kitahara and Eagle Sawai, with the stipulations that the winning team gets an all-expense paid vacation together in Las Vegas. Seriously. The biggest matchup of the tourney was Genichiro Tenryu and Rumi Kazama vs. Nobu Taka Araya and Shinobu Kandori. While they did almost no man vs. woman spots, and the rules prevented it, Kandori did do some spots with Tenryu. Kandori took Tenryu down with a judo throw but Tenryu threw his brutal chops which Kandori sold huge and afterwards said that she had never in her life been hit that hard. All Japan Women starts its annual year-end tag team tournament on October 10th at Karakuen Hall. This year's teams are Yumiko Hata and Manami Toyota, Takako Inoue, and Zap Isozaki, Zap T, Kumiko Makawa and Noriko Toyota, Momoe Nakanishi, and Nani Takahashi, Mio Wakazawa and Keo Nomi and Sachi Nishibori and Emi Motokawa. Here and there. An interesting reality check of the power of television and who and what is really over. For the much-publicized Sandman Northeast farewell autograph session and show on September 25th in Blackwood, New Jersey, the NWA drew about 400, but in the building there was little buzz on Sandman, who showed up as his gimmick so to speak. In fact, Darren Drozdaw sold 53 Polaroids compared to 26 for Sandman. The average fan thinks the real wrestling stars are the ones he sees on WWF and WCW television, no matter how well Paul Heyman produces television for the group that watches ECW. And while there are exceptions to every rule, if you notice most of the ECW wrestlers that leave that don't flop were the ones that were already stars elsewhere, Benoit, Malenko and Guerrero in Japan, Mysterio Jr. in Mexico, etc. Even Raven was something of a star in Oregon and on WWF TV although not a big star. Before coming to ECW, the Heyman creations for the most part, and again, there will always be exceptions, Perry Saturn comes to mind, although anyone that was booked like Saturn with decent talent would be over to an extent and if WCW decides it's going to make Sandman a star, they may succeed, but if left to his own talent without a lot of help, he won't, usually can't survive without Heyman protecting them. 
that ECW versus NWA angle is going nowhere for a lot of reasons, one of which is that with the exception of Stevie Richards, who has some real talent, and Missy Hyatt, who has been a TV star in the business for more than a decade, nobody cares about anyone on the ECW side. Memphis on September 26 was largely continuing the Jerry Lawler vs. Brian Christopher feud. The TV main was Lawler and Bill Dundee vs. Christopher and Billy Travis, with Christopher throughout the show threatening Travis if he turned on him. Christopher said he was only going to team with Travis once but that he believed Randy Hales when he said that Lawler and Dundee were jealous of him and always going to hold him back. They also added Kid Wicked vs. Derek King in a ladder match for the October 3rd Memphis Mid-South Coliseum show. Downtown Bruno, who was fired last week, came back kissing ass to Hales asking for his job back but Hales said he'd see about it. Hales announced the October 3rd main event as Road Warriors against Lawler and whomever wins a battle royal held earlier that night. The announcers were talking about how unfair it was that Austin, I mean Lawler wouldn't even know his partner until that night against a team that has been together for 15 years. Buddy Wayne tried to talk Hales into hiring Sid Vicious, and finally Hales said that if Vicious could beat four guys in a row, he'd sign him to a contract, and later in the show they said Vicious, who was doing an indie show that night yes, hold the presses, Sid showed up for an indie show, had agreed. Lawler did a long interview talking about his 1982 feud with Andy Kaufman. In his new Memphis TV version, he admitted the original angle was a publicity stunt and that he did it because he knew it would get him national publicity and even used the term saying he was looking for the rub from Kaufman, but claimed that he actually did hurt Kaufman because he felt he needed to in order to protect wrestling's credibility. He then told the whole story about the Kerry deal to build up whatever they've got up their sleeve. Brandon Baxter was supposed to wrestle Stacy, but he apologized to her and didn't want to. Hales came out and ordered the match to take place. It wound up with Baxter and Stacy together attacking Hales. The Lawler and Dundee vs. Christopher and Travis ended with a no contest. Travis and Christopher argued throughout the match. Lawler shoved Travis into Christopher and Christopher attacked Travis and they fought each other while Lawler and Dundee stood there and laughed at both of them. They announced that Road Warriors, Giants Silva and Sid would all be on TV on October 2nd. Some changes in the October 24th USWF show in Amarillo. Paul Buntello pulled out of being Evan Tanner's opponent for the heavyweight title in the main event and his place will be taken by former Kingdom wrestler and MMA competitor Larry Parker. Paul Jones, who is booked on the November 27th Shudo card at Karakuen Hall, will still defend the light heavyweight title against former Kingdom and UWFI wrestler Billy Scott. USWF lightweight champion David Elizalde has decided to quit fighting, so that title will be decided in a match pitting Eric Payne, who won a recent tournament, against Bobo Navarrete, with the winner of that match getting a match on the same November 27th judo card. The vacant middleweight title, Steve Nelson held it but he's retiring and actually he will vacate it in a retirement ceremony on this show, will be decided in an eight-man tournament with the favorites being Ali Elias, a local wrestling coach, and Adrian Serrano, who has experience in both Extreme Challenge and Pancrase, and has done well in both places. There is still no opponent for Lisa Hunt in the women's title match. Sid's appearance on an indie was September 25th in Bayonne, New Jersey for Jersey All-Pro Wrestling in front of 360 fans, and he pinned Patch. Next Jap show is October 23rd with King Kong Bundy vs. Yokozuna, since New Jersey deregulated pro wrestling, Yokozuna, who was banned in all commission states due to his inability to pass a physical, can work, and Al Snow vs. Reckless Youth. Terry Funk wrestled Manny Fernandez for NWL on September 26th in Hagerstown, Maryland. Jake Roberts, Butch Reed and Jeff Gaylord are scheduled for Intercontinental Pro Wrestling on October 31st in Little Rock, Arkansas. Jimmy Snuka will be headlining a show on October 4th in Toronto at Applebee's Sports Bar. For more info you can call 416-703-8063. George Shuvalo, a famous boxer from the early 70s who once faced Muhammad Ali, will be doing a managing gig on the show. Among the matches at the October 3rd Music City Wrestling Anniversary Show in Nashville will be Stephen Dunn and Reno Riggins vs. Robert and Jason Gibson, Al Snow vs. Flash Flanagan, Colorado Kid defending the NA title against a wrestler to be announced from the Heel MCW Georgia Group, Brickhouse Brown vs. Bart Sawyer, Shane Eden vs. Wolfie D and more. Carl LaDuke, the son of former wrestling star Jos LaDuke, is also headed in. Jim Kettner's Aqua will be back at the Aqua Arena in Wilmington, Delaware on October 17th, with Christian Cage defending the Aqua title against Sean Stasiak, and Glenn Osborne against another guy highly touted by WWF in Andrew Martin. Arva Londos, the widow of Jim Londos, whose real name was Chris Theopolis, who was the biggest drawing card in American wrestling on a national basis until gorgeous George or perhaps even Andre the Giant, 
passed away on September 25th of a stroke at the age of 86. She had been living in Escondido, California. WWA in Vienna, Austria started a 10-day tour using foreigners from mid-American wrestling out of Wisconsin including Ian Rotten, Billy Joe Eaton, Adam Pierce, Craig the Wave Rider, Axel Future and manager the hustler, Carmen Desperito. Also on the tour are former CWA wrestlers Alf Herman and Michael Kovic, Victor Kruger, the German giant from the Battlers promotion, all of whom Otto Wands won't use anymore for various reasons, and WWF developmental controversy Mick Tierney. On September 26, Eaton beat Pierce to win the Mid-American title, but Pierce won the title back on September 27. Wands has been running his Catch Wrestling Association shows nightly in Hanover, Germany all week. The biggest show was September 26 headlined by Franz Schumann retaining his CWA middleweight title beating Dan Collins of England before 1,000 fans. Foreigners on Wands tour are Rhino Richards, Rico de Cuba, former EMLL wrestler Tony Rico, Cannonball Grizzly, forgettable WCW wrestler PN News, former WCW jobber Robbie Brookside, former New Japan and British vet Tony St. Clair, Bruiser Mastino formerly Mantor in WWF, Texas Claw Trimble, Ice Train, and Joe Legend. MMA Dan Severn beat Joe El Gigante Frawley on September 19th in El Paso, Texas before 1,500 fans at the Super Brawl Battle at the Border Show which was taped for Mexico's TV Azteca. Severn won his match with an armbar in 423, which is believed to be the first time Severn has ever won a match in his career with that move. The match was under rules closer to Pancrase than UFC, so I wouldn't figure it into Severn's MMA record as he still has more wins than any heavyweight in the world in that genre. Carlos Barreto, one of the top Brazilian heavyweights, issued a challenge to boss Rudin claiming that Rudin, who has never fought an MMA fight, needs to at least beat someone with a reputation before challenging an icon like Hicks and Gracie. Thomas Umstead in Multichannel News on September 28 wrote an editorial regarding the pay-per-view industry in regard to a potential double standard regarding UFC and Mike Tyson. He noted that if Tyson doesn't get licensed in Nevada, he would almost surely fight overseas and that every pay-per-view company would carry the fight. He pointed out that it would be using someone banned by all the athletic commissions in the U.S., but they'd have no trouble covering it, however they ban UFC primarily because of the claim it is unsanctioned by the major state athletic commissions. UFC's latest attempt to reverse this is to create a mixed martial arts commission, headed by Jeff Blatnick, which has almost completed an extensive rule book for the sport. Draka held its second U.S. pay-per-view, and the first one available basically nationwide, on September 25th from the Grand Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles there is little to say about the show, since virtually nobody ordered it. We only received five phone calls on the show and considering we can get 100 calls on events that only do 0.1 buy rates, I'd suggest the buy rate fell well below that of the contenders last year at 0.03. There only appear to be around 250 fans at the 7,400-seat Olympic. The matches were fine, but it's impossible to market something in the US which consists of mainly Russian fighters against Thai fighters. The fighters for the most part were more evenly matched than at the K-1 pay-per-view, but the matches were nowhere close to as exciting. Kungla from San Jose, who we've written about, in only his third pro fight, knocked out a legit champion Japanese kickboxer, although Draka rules differ greatly from Japanese kickboxing because knees and elbows are banned from wrestling takedowns are legal in just 51 seconds. Along with Randy Couture, two more members of the Raw team, Vladimir Matyushenko and Frank Trigg, have been added to the October 25th Shudo show at Tokyo Bay NK Hall. Trigg faces Jean-Jacques Machado of the famed Machado fighting family. Trigg was actually first scheduled to be part of the middleweight title tournament on the USWF show on October 24th, but pulled out to do this show instead. It's interesting because before Couture signed to face Ensign Inoue, he had been training with Ensign's brother Egan. ECW. The weekend house shows in Kissimmee, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Florida and Tampa, Florida were all canceled largely due to the threats of Hurricane George. The preliminary hearing on TAS charges was postponed until October 20th. WCW. While this is not confirmed, this does come from people very close to the situation that the giant is either very close to or has completed a deal to go to WWF. He's been talking loudly about it for weeks and some think he's doing that more as a way to get Bischoff's attention and make sure the rumor gets started. He worked all the weekend house shows after missing Utica on September 23rd, 
complaining of a broken rib, although his action was kept to a minimum. The rumor largely stems from three things, his talk of a claim $1 million per year offer and several recent threats to take it, which is quite a bit more than he earns with WCW, coming from WWF, the validity of which is speculative although knowing what Titan and McMahon likes, and the knowledge they've wanted him from the start. Giant fits the bill given his age, 27, and huge size, although if Titan does sign him, they need to drop guys like Silva and Kurgan because they are his size and not even serious characters which kills the uniqueness of his gimmick because he's got nothing but their height and more bulk and they don't even look that tall because they've got all those 6 foot 8 guys running around killing the giant gimmick. His no showing television on September 28th and talk from friends of his in recent days saying that he's going or is already gone not to mention that his career has been stagnant for quite a while don't know his contractual situation but we've heard he's still got a few months to go and wouldn't be able to just walk out right now but that again isn't from a reliable source when it comes to knowledge of his deal. By the way if he were to leave without dropping the tag title, do you think if this was true as again, this is what's called speculation and nothing more, that Titan on principle would withdraw his offer based on him not doing the right thing for the business that made him? Me neither. The biggest topic of conversation over the past week in wrestling was the Bret Hart Wrestling with Shadows movie, as copies of preliminary tapes have gotten around. The movie itself isn't completely finished so nobody has seen what will end up being the finished product, although many have seen very close to a finished product. I don't have definite dates, but the movie will air on television in November in Canada and in December in the US most likely. The video will be released in a few weeks after the movie opens in England on October 19th. Of course this has reopened all the talk about the Survivor Series finish, not to mention been the catalyst of current WWF booking both on the pay-per-view and Raw being that from the booking, it is pretty clear a lot of it is McMahon's attempt to turn the reality into his current fiction. There's a lot I want to say about the movie, the subject of the Survivor Series finish and what led up to it in the situation that went in characters, but I'd rather wait until it airs and address everything at that point, particularly since I'm assuming there will be a lot set in and around wrestling on the subject over the next two months and would also rather that everyone sees it before reading my opinions on that aspect of it. I've seen the movie seven times, which sounds nuts, but partially a lot of my friends, none of whom are wrestling fans, wanted to see it. All liked it a lot and I'm not sure that those who aren't wrestling fans didn't think it was even better than wrestling fans did, but more than the Survivor Series, the strong point of the film was of what an inside view it gave of the profession and as I expected, casual and non-fans had a very different opinion of the various characters than those within the business that have discussed it with me but this is a topic for discussion later but largely confirmed what we wrote in the movie review two weeks ago. The movie gets better and you pick up something new, particularly when it comes to a lot of ironies in the situations, every time you see it. My feeling is after viewing it so many times, that unless you've seen it at least three times, you haven't really seen it. The only change since press time on the October 25th Havoc pay-per-view is that the Billy Kidman vs. Juventud Guerrero Cruiserweight title match has been changed to Guerrero vs. Disco Inferno with the winner getting a title shot, and one would presume Sting vs. Hart is added as that was the plan all along for the show. Nitro on September 28th drew a sellout 10,523, 9,814 paying $247,660 at the new Blue Cross Arena in Rochester, New York. It opened with Bischoff, Hogan, Brian Adams and Scott Hall coming out. There was this huge giant-sized photo of McMahon on the hard camera side behind them. Hogan challenged both Sting and Hart and went on and on about he made wrestling. La Parca pinned Super Colo in the return for both men in 532 with a corkscrew moonsault block. Real good match and fans were into it. Colo hit Parca with a chair a few times after the match and pounded on the mat very near Parca with a chair hard a few times after that. Hart came out to a mixed reaction and accepted Hogan's challenge, and the rest of the show Tony Schiavone and Mike Tenney did a great job of building up the significance of this being the first meeting these two have ever had. Disciple beat Sick Boy in 158 with a stunner. The show started falling apart here. Fans booed the hell out of Disciple even though he's supposed to be with Warrior, actually partially because of that, and partially because he's Disciple, until the match started, and then they went to sleep. He no old everything poorly. Scott Steiner beat both Nick Dinsmore and Lenny Lane with the double camel clutch in 233. Scott took no bumps. Warrior showed up without the steam, as I hope they've learned from other cities and TV ratings that nerve gas kills ratings. Unfortunately, as this reaction showed, it wasn't the nerve gas, it's Warrior himself. He got cheered coming out but immediately was being booed out of the place with loud Warrior sucks chants. A fan hit the ring in the middle of his interview and he again forgot what he was supposed to say. Awful segment. It isn't as if everyone didn't warn Bischoff going in about Warrior having a very short shelf life, like two or three weeks, 
of being effective because he isn't adapting to 1998 wrestling which is a totally different world than 1992, and the wrestling world isn't going to change to adapt to him. The only thing left for him to do besides kill ratings and buy rates after Havoc, and the fact his first match in years did such a bad buy rate wasn't a good sign either, which still may do well just because of the matchup after more than 8 years, is for Goldberg to spear him, which will get Goldberg hot again, and chalk it up to experience. I can't tell you how many people within WCW were predicting that by 5 weeks in, the fans would be begging for Goldberg to spear him and here we are. Ernest Miller beat Psychosis in 319 with a roundhouse kick. Chavo Guerrero Jr. wrestled Disco Inferno, ending at 439 when Disco hit Chavo with Pepe, but Juventud Guerrero ran in and told the ref. Disco gave Juventud a pile driver. Fans cheered because they thought it was a cool move, but what they didn't realize is that meant Juventud's match with Kaz Hayashi was cancelled, and they missed out on the only great wrestling they were going to see. Horseman came out. Flair said a few words, and almost immediately Bischoff came out with about a million officers and started screaming at Arn Anderson about felonious assault because of what he did on Thunder to Stevie Ray. The cops escorted not only the horseman, but also Doug Dillinger out of the building. Shuvani was hilarious later in the show when another fan hopped the guardrail and he said that's what happens when you send Dillinger out of the building, and supposedly to jail. There are a lot of people in wrestling who probably deserve to be arrested after their interviews, but Flair isn't one of them. Bischoff started ripping Flair about using his 10-year-old to hide behind as an excuse for not showing up. Given how bad the show was, it would have been nice to hear Flair talk longer and Anderson talk a little, but it was a good angle. They advertised Bill Goldberg versus Chris Jericho. Goldberg carried the fake Goldberg, who definitely isn't C.C. Develling, on his shoulders to the ring. When Jericho saw the real Goldberg was there, he left, so Goldberg tackled the two guys in the Jericho security force. He gave one a jackhammer, and the guy didn't know how to go up, Goldberg muscled him anyway. The old guy who looked like Brasso de Plata was just left to lay there motionless on the mat. Hall pinned Kidman in 613 with the edge. This was brilliant booking. They have 100 guys on the roster who don't mean crap that can put Hall over, so they chose to cut the legs off another young guy who was getting over. Not to mention made it basically non-competitive and pretty much destroyed not only their cruiserweight champ but the entire division by the portrayal of this match. Even though WWF is even more retarded when it comes to its light heavyweight division, when a guy starts getting hot in WWF, they keep pushing him until he starts cooling off and if it means upsetting an established star, so be it. In WCW when a guy starts getting hot, they immediately have an established star squash him, unless the company got the guy hot as opposed to one of those guys who just catches on for no apparent reason. Unless as some people think this is all just a prelude of Kidman beating Hall and they're redoing the original 1-2-3 Kid gimmick. Davy Boy Smith drew Alex Wright in 426. I won't say this was Smith's first good match in WCW, because that's going too far. But it was the best he's looked and he did two good moves, one of which, his La Tapatia upside down surfboard. The crowd popped big for. There was a ref bump and a second ref came in. Right back suplexed Smith and both guys got a shoulder up at two but each ref blew the call. It was a lot better when Smith did it with Shawn Michaels on that pay-per-view show in the middle of a storm a few years back. Kevin Nash beat Adams via DQ in 243 when Stevie Ray and Vincent interfered. Hall came out, threw out his drink, and attacked Nash. The idea is that Hall's drunk gimmick, which is dying in the ratings, is teased as being over so there is some seriousness to the Nash match. But for whatever reason, it's certainly not a definite the gimmick is done for good. Lex Luger and Conan beat mean Gene Darso and Hugh Morris in 218 when Lex racked Darso while Conan put the tequila sunrise on Morris. Hogan vs. Hart wound up with Hogan dropping Hart's knee on the guardrail twice, wrapped it around the post and kept working on it until Sting showed up. Luger and Conan dragged Hart away and tied him on a stretcher where the ambulance was ready. Scott Steiner and Bagwell jumped Conan and Luger. Hart got off the stretcher and limped back. Sting was beating on Hogan and had him in the Scorpion when Hart, cheering Sting on, gave Sting a DDT and destroyed him and Hogan and Hart laughed together at the end. Luger and Conan came out for the save but it just got weird and fell apart at this point. The lights went out and Warrior was supposed to do a run-in to save Luger and Conan, except they never got in the ring to begin with due to massive miscommunication and the show just went off the air three minutes early without Warrior doing anything. The TV show Extra had a segment on Goldberg heavily playing up the Jewish angle. Giant and Sting both no-showed Utica, New York on September 23rd where they were scheduled for a singles main event. Giant missed due to a rib injury and Sting due to personal problems. They flew in Rick Steiner and main event ended up being Luger and Steiner beating Hall and Ray. 
Raven, Jericho and Disco will be appearing soon on an episode of The Dating Game. Thunder on September 24th in Norfolk drew a sellout 8,858, 8,153 paying $154,630. The show drew a 3.42 rating and 5.40 share against the season openers of Friends and Frasier among others. Replay was a 1.0 rating and 4.1 share. Rating was below par, but the show has with few exceptions, been below par for a long time. Show opened with a few matches taped for the October 1st show with DDP over Lodi, Mike Enos vs. Jerry Flynn ending in a no contest when Hall showed up drunk and beat both guys up, Kenyon beat Scotty Riggs and Rath beat Cyclope. Live show opened with Rick Steiner over Morris in 229 with a bulldog off the top. Miller beat Dinsmore with a round kick in 141, Saturn pinned Psychosis in 751 with a frog splash. For whatever reason, this wasn't supposed to be the finish but ref Billy Silverman counted three anyway even though Psychosis kicked out and Saturn reacted as if he expected the kick out and was mad about the finish being screwed up. Wright did an interview and called Shuvani a pig and an out-of-shape, overweight loser. He then challenged Fit Finley, Norman Smiley, and Davy Boy Smith, I guess to determine who the best European wrestler in WCW is. Smiley has never been billed from Europe in the first place. Finley pinned Barbarian with a tombstone pile driver in 448. Page did an interview. Page was cheered even though he's wrestling Goldberg. On Monday, Gene Okerlund tried to compare his match with Page with Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. Raven beat Viano V with a DDT in 216. They hyped this as a grudge match because of the injury to Viano 4, who was legitimately hurt and taken to the hospital, but was already back in the ring on September 25th. Then they squashed V5 quickly. Can't let an unfortunate situation hand you an angle without, like Bagwell, just slapping it back because it wasn't your idea to start with. Viano 4 is back on the injured list. Apparently he went to Baltimore and Fairfax with the idea that all he was going to do is set up switching spots with his brother in tags. However, in Fairfax, he got a little enthusiastic since they were having a good match and started doing high spots and re-injured his neck. Disco beat Chavo with a pile driver in 7.30. Best match on the show. After the match Juvie came out with a piece of paper and apparently Disco had forged his weight on it. They brought out a scale and Disco supposedly weighed over the cruiser limit. Then they raised Chavo's hand. Shuvani said that was the first time in pro wrestling history he'd ever seen such a thing. There's probably a good reason for that. Wright beat Smiley with a neckbreaker in 608. The horseman came out and yes, for the sixth straight show Arn Anderson was in the highest rated segment. Stevie Ray acted like he was going to stop them. So did Doug Dillinger. Dillinger turned his back and let them go out. Ray just walked behind a curtain and Anderson hit him with a tire iron. Goldberg kept the title beating Canyon in 21 seconds. After that was over they taped more matches for October 1st. Kidman kept the title beating Chavo. Van Hammer beat Lane. Disco beat Damien. Don't know for sure the finish of Conan vs. Ray but believe Vincent interfered for the DQ and Nash made the safe power bombing Vincent. Finally Goldberg beat Raven. Raven brought out a table. Canyon kept interfering. Raven put himself through the table when Goldberg moved. Page ran in and gave Canyon a diamond cutter while Goldberg pinned Raven with the jackhammer. Then they turned around and had a stare down. It is no secret within the company that Warrior is dying and the realization that unless something is done quickly, he's taking Hogan down with him. They still may do a good buy rate for the next pay-per-view, though it's going down and not escalating with every bit of hype added to the mix. In the United Kingdom, they are now airing Thunder right after Nitro on Friday night so with some editing of each show for content, it's about a four and a half hour nightly block of WCW which is said to be at this point pure torture. Nitro in UK goes head to head still with Raw and it's still a dead heat, although the audience for both shows has grown. On September 4th, Nitro had 350,000 homes and Raw had 340,000, and on September 11th, Raw had 330,000 and Nitro had 320,000. Some talk that Hall vs. Nash in a bar fight match which will be taped in a bar-like environment will take place at either World War III or Starcade. The plan is for 10-year-old Reed Fleer to appear on Nitro and do an angle with Bischoff on October 5th in Columbia, South Carolina. Some talk of Terry Taylor returning to the ring in a visible underneath role as a heel. In the angle on September 21st from Boston where Hogan found Disciple asleep on the bathroom floor and the steam came, you can actually see in the bathroom window a guy firing off a fire extinguisher. Not nearly as lame as that Ed Leslie doll in the rafters.
Actually, they can save some money by hiring Jason Sensation from WWF and just create dolls of people like Helwig and Piper who have big names but can't do good interviews anymore. He'll work cheaper, his interviews will be better and he can do more believable angles. Latest word has it that Sandman starts around December and Vampiro, who was going to start at Havoc, won't be in until January. Vampiro has convinced the bookers to give him a huge push and he was going to drop from the ceiling a la Sting at Havoc, but it appears Bischoff totally nicks that idea since he has Warrior in the rafters and wants to save the dropping from the ceiling gimmick for the black and white Sting deal so now there are basically no ideas for Vampiro. Barbarian injured his neck. Brett and Owen Hart did work together on an episode of the TV show Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. There is still a lot of talk about adding Hart and subtracting McMichael from the Horsemen. The plan is to keep Flair's return to the ring held off until Starcade at the earliest, but plans mean nothing the way the business is going now. WCW is doing a promotion on October 1st where its wrestlers are going to be ringing the closing bell that day at the New York Stock Exchange. It's part of a promotion with Capital Bank where they are releasing bank cards with WCW wrestlers' faces on them. Appearing at the promotion are scheduled to be Hogan, Savage, Goldberg, Sting, EDP, Luger, Nash, and Hart. Telemundo is shopping around for a Hispanic-oriented television show to compete with the proposed WWF show on Univision. The problem once again with WCW, and there have been negotiations on and off for a long time, is that Telemundo doesn't want a show where the stars of the show are the jobbers on the other shows. House shows this past week saw September 22nd in Amherst, Massachusetts for the Saturday night tapings drew 1,437 paying $31,698, September 25th in Baltimore drew 10,076 paying $249,760. September 26th in Fairfax, Virginia drew 7,973 paying $216,712 and September 27th in Erie, Pennsylvania drew 2,273 paying $52,354. Amherst and Erie are the first genuinely poor houses in months. Reports from Baltimore and Fairfax were both shows were really bad with the exception of a solid Guerrera vs. Silver King opener in Baltimore and a very good Guerrera and Psychosis and Kolo vs. Villanos and Silver King match in Fairfax. Hall replaced Hart, storyline reasons against Sting in Baltimore with Sting winning. The only notable thing about that is Hall saying there was going to be a big party at the hotel after the show and asked all the young women to ask for Scott Hall and all the fags to ask for Kevin Nash. Goldberg beat Giant in two minutes in the main event. Goldberg Giant was the advertised main event for Fairfax but with Giant being hurt, he was switched to a tag with Luger and Nash over Giant and Ray where Ray basically worked the entire match. Hart beat Hall in two minutes with a sharpshooter with Hall just selling like he was drunk and Hart winning easily. Fans cheered Hart's win, but then booed after, almost as if they realized they hated the idea of such a short match. Goldberg pinned Sting in the main event. The only report we had from Erie is that WCW forget to get plane tickets for the Mexican wrestlers. So they had to drive from Fairfax to Erie and ended up not making it there on time. They had gone to the airport and were told electronic tickets would be waiting for them and there were no tickets when they got there. Merchandise for the week, which includes the Nitro in Boston on September 21st, was $380,112, or $7.04 per head. The New York Times on September 25th ran a story about the decline in Monday night football ratings, off 11% from last year so far, and did list the popularity of pro wrestling as a key reason. WCW Saturday night on September 26th fell to a 1.8 rating. Kurt Hennig is out of action again as his knee has worsened. WWF TV taping on September 28th in Detroit drew a sellout 14517 paying $308,630 to Joe Louis Arena. Before Raw started, they taped some shotgun and dark matches. Andrew Martin beat someone. Too Much won a squash and were then challenged by the Hardy Boys. Bob Holly beat Brooklyn Brawler via submission. Bradshaw beat Larry Brune. Eight Ball beat Scorpio when the Twins did the switch. Takamichi Noku retained the light heavyweight title, yes, it still exists, beating Shoichi Funaki. Yamaguchi was feverishly trying to keep Kayantai in one piece as this was going on, and after the match they got back together. Jacqueline retained the women's title beating Starla Sexton. Tiger Ali Singh offered $600 for anyone to eat a booger out of Babu's nose and Adam Swallow did it. And finally, the Hardy Boys beat too much via DQ. Ross started with McMahon out there saying that unlike last time when Austin lost the title, this time there would be no rematch. 
he put the belt around his waist and said he'd announce the new champ later in the show and had a ton of police guarding the back door to make sure Austin didn't show up and attack him. Do you ever worry about all the local criminals in these cities like Detroit and Rochester? And God knows they all follow pro wrestling these days. Figuring out the best night to go out and commit crimes has to be Monday because the entire police force is hanging out at the Coliseum doing fake wrestling angles. Southern Justice beat Outlaws via DQ in a tag title match in three minutes. Billy was about to finish off Canterbury when Road Dog hit him with Jarrett's guitar for the DQ. Billy was mad at Road Dog and they started arguing. X Pac came out and Billy hit him in his bad eye. Triple H and China came down, Triple H in a wheelchair, and he shoved them aside. Later in the show they gave the impression they were fighting in the locker room, and Billy walked out of the building by himself. Ross over the weekend was really trying to put Billy over as the best athlete in the WWF, as I guess they recognize how short they are on singles heels these days. It was really sad for Ross because just as he was talking about Gunn's amazing agility, he threw this terribly mistimed dropkick where he barely got off the ground. Owen Hart and Dan Severn did their angle where Hart gave him a reverse pile driver and Dan did a stretcher job. There were a lot of people who bought this. It was real obvious live, although what threw people off was Owen breaking character and acting concerns similar to how Raven acted the week before when he accidentally hurt before. I'd go into the giveaways, aside from the storyline the remainder of the show that fit in, but the next time they'd correct those and I'd be all worried about it too. Actually Severn was hurt a little as he was dropped right on his head as the replay showed, but the deal was an angle. Supposedly the idea is they needed to turn Severn babyface since they're going heel with Shamrock, but there's probably a lot more to it than that. Severn came out with the NWA and UFC belts if you're looking for a clue. He was also super over since they were in Detroit and the fans were really into the match. Al Snow pinned Vader in 237 after hitting him with the head. Sergeant Slaughter was in Vader's corner and interfered. Vader actually kicked out of the finish so fans booed the finish. A six-man elimination for a shot at the European title had edge, Gangrel, Jarrett Marrow, Brown, and Drozdov. It was a fast-paced all-action good match, ending when Edge was distracted by both Gangrel and Christian Cage and Brown gave him the powerbomb for the pin in 5.09. McMahon came out with the Stooges. Austin showed up on a Zamboni and drove it from outside the building as the cops scattered. I'd sure sleep easy if I was living in Detroit with a force like that, and right to the ring and he jumped off the Zamboni with a clothesline on McMahon. Finally the police handcuffed him and took him away. McMahon was going nuts again. Great angle. McMahon, all disheveled came back out with Undertaker and Kane. He blamed both of them for not protecting him from Austin and that they didn't hold up their end of the deal so he wasn't holding up his. He ordered them to wrestle for the title at the next pay-per-view with Austin as ref. He then ordered them in a two-on-three handicap match against Shamrock, Mankind and Rock later in the show. He called Kane physically defective and Taker mentally defective. Vince flipped them off behind their back but Taker turned around, and they destroyed Vince with Taker using the same knee cross that he injured Animal and Blackman with and then destroyed his ankle with the ring steps. The ankle is the same one he was limping on after breaking it after being knocked out by Hart in Montreal, and if you don't think one has to do with the other, you don't understand the way minds work in this industry. McMahon was carried out but no ambulance because it had left with Severn. Farouk beat Mark Henry with China as ref when China gave Henry a low blow, Farouk fell on him and she fast counted Henry a 114. China was then served papers which she tore up. Shamrock did a heel interview saying he never liked Detroit. Earlier in the show it was established that Shamrock lost to Severn in Detroit in UFC. Another goofy Steve Regal vignette aired. Kurgan and Golga beat headbangers in 158. The biggest story was that ICP was in the building and boy are they on the verge of being great heels. Golga got a much bigger Cartman doll. Venus beat X-Pac Venus via DQ in a European title match in 315. X-Pac is one hell of a worker because this was real good. China showed up and attacked Terry Runnels to a big pop. China attacked Venus. After the match a video aired basically showing that Runnels was reverting back to being Goldust, they played the Goldust music and had a video on the screen and dropped glitter from the ceiling. Venus and Runnels sold it big and the crowd popped big. Main event saw Rocky and Shamrock and Mankind beat Undertaker and Kane in a 2-on-3, it was a lot more entertaining since Rocky's team spent more time beating each other up than their opponents and the stuff they were doing was great. When they actually wrestled Taker and Kane it wasn't much. Mankind took one sick bump after another from just about everyone. Ross made a reference about not seeing any bald 45-year-olds playing air guitar. I guess the vow to stop knocking the opposition has ended. Place went nuts for the people's elbow.
Actually Shamrock got a huge pop as a face when he put Taker in the ankle lock, so go figure. You could hear Earl Heckner scream 45 seconds to go and everyone panicked and the match fell apart at the finish. Although they did get the big spot of Rock putting the rock bottom on Undertaker for the pin in 1251. Taker and Kane then argued after the match. We only have sketchy reports from the September 29th taping in East Lansing, Michigan. Brown won back the European title from X-Pac with a frog splash. Hart announced due to the grief of injuring both Austin and Severn with the pile driver that he would be leaving the WWF. Road Dog beat Henry when X-Pac interfered. Marrow pinned Vader with a shooting star. Marrow and Sable argued after the match. Obviously the intention is for Vader to go home and they're probably now just trying to get out of his guaranteed contract. Shamrock beat Kane. Kane was on the top rope and Taker shook the rope and Kane crotched himself. Shamrock delivered a superplex and got the pin. Venus beat Gangrel via count out when Ed showed up with Cage this time and Gangrel was distracted. Snow beat Jarrett via DQ when he was caught using a foreign object Canterbury gave him. Slaughter was at ringside watching. Taker pinned Rock with a tombstone pile driver on a chair. At one point Kane hit Taker with a chair but Taker still survived that. Taker was also hit with Rock bottom but the ref wasn't there to count. Motley Crue, the rock band, including Tommy Lee, will be appearing on the October 20th Raw taping in their hometown of Madison, Wisconsin which airs October 26th. WWF is working with A&E on a movie about the life of Andre the Giant. Should be one entertaining work of fiction. The deal is mentioned last week where they start doing three-day tapings instead of two days is a done deal and will start on November 1st in Houston. The November 29th taping will be in Philadelphia, although due to a hockey game in the core state center that night, the show will be a noon start so heat that week will air on a few-hour tape delay. The only shows this past week were the pay-per-view and TV tapings. Detroit by itself did $143,329 in merchandise, which was $9.87 per head which is way above what virtually every city has been doing of late for either group. At this point the belief is that Triple H will be out of the ring until early November after the knee scope. Steve Blackman is supposed to start back this week but his knee is nowhere close to 100%. Godfather should return in one week. Steve Williams' return looks to be around mid-November and Steven Regal will debut in the ring likely at the next set of tapings. Weekend ratings saw Live Wired do a 1.7, Superstars fell to another 1.2 while Heat preceding the pay-per-view show Live did a 3.32 rating and 5.66 share which again is a lower rating for a live pre-pay-per-view show than they normally do with the taped show. For those who say the reason the rating drops on the live heat shows before PPVs is because of the West Coast being that on the West Coast heat airs head-to-head -head with the final hour of the pay-per-view, if you figure this show did 60,000 buys in the Pacific time zone, which is a very liberal estimate, and every one of those homes would have viewed heat which isn't the case but let's pretend, that would only increase the rating to 3.40 so statistically that only means just under 0.1 ratings points. They replayed the Pack Blue episode with Triple H, reruns already, and it only did a 1.8, and the rest of the USA Sunday lineup which usually does in the low twos was down to 1.3s. The Reader's Pages Lawler slash Gary I spent last Friday in Los Angeles as an extra in the audience during the first of three days filming the infamous Andy Kaufman vs. Jerry Lawler match for Milos Foreman's Man on the Moon movie. Jim Carrey looked an awful lot like Kaufman, although he looked sort of like a gorilla, too, deliberately slumping his shoulders and neck and sticking out his lips. But he really doesn't have Kaufman down. I should say here that in addition to being a big wrestling fan, I think Kaufman is God. It was obvious that Kerry was doing Kaufman, not being Kaufman. I was kind of disappointed in his performance. Kerry wouldn't take any bumps. They brought in a stunt double for both the suplex and pile driver spot. Jerry Lawler was absolutely great, and I don't like Jerry Lawler. I think you could wake that guy up at 4 a.m. and he could play the king. Lance Russell was also great as an announcer. Jim Ross was with him at the announcer's table but he said nothing that we could hear. Unlike real life, Lawler only gave Kaufman one pile driver, not two. Unlike real life, Andy's wife, was he even married at the time? Played by Courtney Love ran into the ring as Kaufman was being stretchered out. Unlike real life, they combined into this one scene a few different bits that Kaufman really did over a few month period when he was antagonizing the Memphis crowd and building up the match. He did his This Is Soap bit in the ring, he sang the I'm the King of Memphis, I'll Knock Lawler Out song, etc., all things that he really did, but none of which he did in real life during the match. About 85% of the crowd of about 3,000 even knew who Andy Kaufman was, who Jerry Lawler was or anything about pro wrestling. 
they were there to be in a movie and because they knew Carey and love. They actually were booing Lawler and cheering Andy just because it was Jim Carey until Foreman told them, you are in Memphis. Jerry Lawler was like a god in Memphis. You do not boo the god of Memphis. Once the audience knew this, they gave really good reactions to what was going on. The ring entrances were very well done. Mondo Guerrero was announced as the ref. Not sure if it was Mondo Guerrero. It looked like an old-timer wrestler, but somebody there said it was really judo Jean LaBelle and I'm not sure. Lawler has pasted on that stupid goatee he wore in those days. He had to keep pushing it back on his chin to make sure it wasn't falling off. They shot the same scene ten times, single introductions, different angles, straight through until the suplex, the stretcher scene, the stunt double taking the bumps. The Los Angeles Grand Olympic Auditorium was dressed up with lots of Mid-South Coliseum and USWA banners up. Kerry kept provoking both Lawler and the fans even when they weren't filming. Finally, during a break in filming, they did a spot where the ref catches Kerry, Lawler tried to dropkick Kerry, and he got up really high and threw a great dropkick. But Kerry slips out and the ref got nailed. The fans got into that spot. But I actually heard a fan behind me say, that was fake. Let me repeat that. On a movie set during a break from filming a pro wrestling scene involving a long since dead man, a person actually said, that was fake. After all the filming was over, and we were being thanked for being the best group of extras that we've ever worked with, and don't think that isn't going on my resume, Carrie attacked Lawler, hitting him with some really sad-looking forearms. Lawler broke up and was sort of laughing and pretending to be confused. Lawler put Carrie down, then climbed to the top rope and dove pretty far across the ring, it was a small ring, and used his fist drop. Carrie sold it well. The assistant director was acting like the whole thing was a shoot, saying that you never know where real life ends and fantasy begins. Then I just heard that Lawler supposedly attacked Carrie for real after Carrie spit at him. I'm sure it's a work as the people associated with the movie were telling us that if you thought the filming was crazy, wait until you see what Lawler and Carrie have planned to promote the movie. They do angles like this every week in wrestling, but this time, since a star is involved, it gets mainstream press. When the press finds out this was all a work, they'll probably write more articles about what dopes wrestling fans are. But I'm sure most wrestling fans knew what it was, and it was only the mainstream media that ever took it seriously in the first place. Mike McNulty. San Francisco, California. Dual reality. The growing prevalence of dual reality angles, as you so aptly dubbed them, carries with aid a number of potentially serious problems in my opinion. For starts, there's the age-old matter of just how far the envelope should be pushed. Maybe Eric Bischoff can mock Jim Duggan's bout with cancer and build an angle around it. Perhaps Vince McMahon will create a ribald storyline around the real-life trauma of one of his wrestlers and his girlfriend opting to have an abortion. Where do you draw the line? And when does it become truly a fence and no longer a ratings generator? Next, there's the problem that eventually ruined television's glut of home video and blooper-based shows a number of years ago. That is, people began staging the supposed mishaps and innocent little scenes that captured everyone's fancy. So a wrestler may actually pick a real-life fight in the locker room, knowing full well that there's a better-than-even chance the boss will end up working an angle or program around it. Better yet, why not sleep with the wife of another wrestler since that will provide even more juicy reality to build an angle? No matter how you slice it, it's just another opportunity for things to get seriously out of control. Finally, there's the matter of trust. These angles have the potential to be dangerous enough. But often they add another layer. The specific attempts to dupe the very people who work for the company into believing the angles are real. It's tough enough to build camaraderie and trust in a normal company these days. For the pro wrestling business, it's exponentially more difficult. This kind of nonsense, done for no purpose other than some ego gratification of working the boys, in the long run can only make things even worse. By the way, I vehemently disagree with my father's recent letter that advocates the induction of Gene Stanley into the Hall of Fame. Stanley was a mediocre wrestler and a miserable interview who no more deserves induction than Hillbilly Jim. But dad doesn't get it, and that's another dual reality. Jeff Siegel. Evanston, Illinois. WCW. Can anyone explain to me what Ernest Miller, Stevie Ray or anyone on the NWOB team have done to be on pay-per-view or on television for longer than two minutes? Worst thing about these guys isn't seeing them wrestle, but giving them interview time. I think you could find quite a few candidates for worst interview among the WCW roster. All I can say is Miller's Mike skills make Ultimo Dragon's MTV interview look like an all-time great promo. I don't think Scott Hall or Hawk are acting drunk or stoned. They must be watching WCW television like the rest of us. 
Sometimes I just pass out like all those NWO guys do at the end of a show. Was everyone surprised just like I was that Diamond Dallas Page won war games. After all, he is the hardest working man in the business and nobody in WCW has paid their dues more than he has. He's the reason people tune in to watch Nitro. Not Jericho. Not Goldberg. Not Wolfpack. Not even Hogan. And definitely not Flair. He was also responsible for some of the most memorable matches of 1998. Just listen to the crowd reaction for DDP when he confronted the Wolfpack. The fans cheered his every word just like that Piper guy. Why did WCW sign Sandman? I just hope the ECW marks don't start with their stupid you sold out chant at him because if any of us were given the same opportunity, we'd just at the chance. I only wonder what WCW will do with him. The obvious thing is to do the same old ECW angle with Raven. It won't be as violent and will probably wind up looking like a public enemy match. They should create a third NWO group called NWO Rehab with Hall, Sandman, and Brian Adams. The rehab idea would work since they're trying to do reality-based angles. Guerrero's interviews about Bischoff, Hall acting drunk, and the WCW slash Flair angle. What's next? Some juiced-up wrestlers throwing a boulder through a local McDonald's being caught on tape. Wrestlers attacking fans who throw objects at them. An announcer with an opinion of his own. Miller vs. Norman Smiley on pay-per-view. Davy Boy Smith and Jim Neidhart winning on pay-per-view. Those matches should be dedicated to every idiot that chanted boring in pay-per-view matches with Chris Benoit, Rey Mysterio Jr., Booker T., Ultimo Dragon and La Parca. Does Lucha Libre mean something other than wrestling? Maybe I just misunderstand the pre-match hype. All along I was under the impression the X-Pac vs. Jeff Jarrett match at SummerSlam was a hair vs. hair match. Isn't it strange how Vince McMahon and Jim Ross keep talking about wanting to build the WWF around great young talent when they use Takamichi Noku and Brian Christopher as jobbers for guys like Kurgan Golga and Giant Silva. The two funniest guys in wrestling today are Chris Jericho and Mark Merrow. I mean, I thought the Johnny B. Bad gimmick was stupid, but he sure showed WCW. The Undertaker and Hunter Hearst Helmsley's comments about Ric Flair came from two guys who, if Flair came to WWF, wouldn't be pushed as much as they are now. Neither of the two can even carry Flair's jock. At 49, Flair is a more consistent performer than the majority of those currently on the WWF roster. During a match against Saturn, Canyon made the comment that he was the best. Tony Schiavone responded by saying he could name 10 or 12 guys better. I'm glad he didn't name names because he'd come off looking like an even bigger retard. Schiavone said it takes more than a good offense to be a great wrestler. Besides kissing the boss's ass, what else does it take? The oddities, Stevie Ray, Steve McMichael, Horace Boulder, Brian Adams, etc. who are going to be the winners of this year's most coveted Observer Awards. Finally, did I read this or was this a misprint? You wrote that Jason Hervey is one of the many true geniuses behind the writing of Nitro. Who do you think is the best booker among the group? Isn't Jason Harvey the guy that Paul Heyman pounded? First Hervey and who's next? I've heard Gary Coleman is also looking for work. Fred Esparza. Pomona, California. Response from Dave Meltzer, Lucha Libre in English would be translated as free fighting. It has become the Spanish word for pro wrestling. When I was a kid and they had WWF wrestling or Los Angeles wrestling on the local Spanish station, it was both referred to as Lucha Libre even though it was American style wrestling and now the style we'd refer to today as Lucha Libre, the Mexican rhythmic dance style wrestling. The Portuguese term Lucha Libre, which also means free fight has basically become the term in that language and in Brazil for an offshoot of UFC-style fighting. And the term free fighting itself in Holland is the term for ring-style fighting. Hall of Fame Here is a list of those I think should be included in the Hall of Fame. Arn Anderson. He was one of the most underrated workers ever and deserves to be in just for giving us some great matches and some of the best promos ever. Haystacks Calhoun. Honest to God, I think he should be in. He was one of the first really heavy pro wrestlers and was a good draw and really over as a fat hillbilly comedy figure, especially in battle royals and handicap matches. Besides, in his prime he wasn't any worse of a worker than Sergeant Slaughter, who got a good deal of consideration this year. Carlos Colon. You can't judge his career on the Jose Gonzalez deal. The man is a legend whose accomplishments speak for themselves. Kiyoshi Tamura. A miracle worker when it comes to building matches and in the art of the work shoot as his June match with Tsuyoshi Kosaka reiterated. I think he belongs in, for among other things, being able to carry some really bad opponents like Bitsaid Terriel to great believable matches. Eddie Gilbert. 
I think he deserves to be in based on being somewhat of an enigma in pro wrestling. An entertaining heel who usually drew well, particularly when he would wrestle Jerry Lawler at the Mid-South Coliseum and a good worker. He occupied a unique place in the industry and was almost always in demand, be it in Memphis, Japan, Puerto Rico or pretty much any place. I largely agree with the list of the top 5 All Japan matches in the September 14th issue, except I would have put the January 1995 Kenna Kobashi vs. Toshiaki Kauta 60 minutes draw from Osaka on the list. It was probably one of the top 12 matches of the decade, and what's amazing about it is that just a few days later, the two were involved in a tremendous Mitsuharu Misawa and Kobashi vs. Kaoda and Akira Tawe 60 minutes tag team match. Chris Copeland. Crossville, Tennessee. Response from Dave Meltzer, this is not a judgment of Calhoun's credentials, but there is no way that there is any comparison between Calhoun at his peak and Slaughter at his peak. After 1984, Slaughter realized he could get away with leading chance and not taking bumps, got out of shape, and for the most part he was awful. Calhoun, to his credit, was very good at working within the confines of his gimmick until late in his career as guys of that size really lose their mobility. But from 1979 to 1984, Slaughter was a spectacular worker. This is the end of this program. See you next time.